Smoke, brought to you tonight by Plymouth, with an invitation for you to visit a Plymouth dealer's tomorrow. Meet the new Plymouth and enter the big $25,000 contest. Throughout Kansas and in the territories on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers. And that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. It's here, a new kind of low-priced car. The exciting 53 Plymouth, completely new, completely beautiful. Yes, it's the new Plymouth for 1953. The first truly balanced car in the low-priced field. More glamorous lines, more powerful engine, more luxurious comfort. What a beauty. The new 53 Plymouth is lower to the road with a lot lower look. New color schemes and two-tone color harmonies available in all models. How does she travel? Man, Plymouth puts out the best ride in the business. Smooth as sailing, even in the back seat. And the Plymouth engine's been stepped up to 100 horsepower for pickup with plenty of flash. Visibility? I say, there's a one-piece curved windshield, a new type with no troublesome distortion, and you sit chair height in a Plymouth, so you get the full benefit of Plymouth's new down-sweeping hood. You really see right down in front of your car. Bigger side windows, too, and a huge wraparound rear window, so everyone gets a view as big as all outdoors. The new 53 Plymouth's an exciting car any way you look at it. A great advance in car value at no advance in price. In fact, four new Plymouth models actually cost less than last year. So don't put off seeing it. Meet the new 53 Plymouth at your nearby Plymouth dealers. If you go in tomorrow, you may win one free in the big Meet the New Plymouth contest. And now, Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon. United States Marshal. The cook sure must have had a bad night, Mr. Dillon. Well, how do you figure that, Chester? Well, sir, I never saw so much chili pepper on a couple of poor eggs. <laughs> he must figure everybody's got a hangover this morning. Almost everybody usually has of a Sunday around here. <laughs> well, now, I clean up forgot all about it being Sunday. No. <laughs> uh, so that's why Jim Cobbett's all dressed up over there, huh? First time I've ever seen him with his hair combed in. Well, uh, well haven't you heard about Jim, Chester? He's going to get married. He's got his wife-to-be coming in on the train from back east today. Jim Cobbett? Yeah. Well, now, what sort of a woman would that be, Mr. Dillon, who'd come clear to Dodge City to marry a fellow like Jim? No, Jim's a good man, Chester. It's just that, well, living out on that homestead of his year after year has made him grow a little off-center, so... Loneliness will do that to a man sometimes. Morning, Marshal. Chester. Morning, Hank. Well, what do you think of that old goat Jim Cobbett getting himself hitched? It's a fine thing, I'd say. Well, Jim's no older than you are, Hank Lewis. No older, maybe. A lot less respectable. Now you're talking your usual nonsense, Hank. Am I, Marshal? What about Jim's first wife who disappeared off of that place he had up north on Hackberry Creek? Just plain disappeared, she did. Jim never explained that, and nobody ever saw her again, either. Oh, you're worse than an old woman with your gossip, Hank. Jim's never done anything to you, Hank. Nothing except stake his homestead on the only spring south of the Smoky that didn't dry up. Cheated me out of it, that's what. He filed his claim two weeks before you did, Hank, and everybody knows it. Sneaked into town, that's what he did. Sneaked into town, behind my back. Still telling your lies, ain't you, Hank Lewis? Now, now you keep away from me, Jim. Keep, keep away. I've never bothered you, Hank. But I hear you talking around Lila. When she gets here, I'll hurt you. I'll hurt you bad. Well, this is you want to hide from her, Jim. Maybe that business about your first wife. All right, don't touch that gun, Hank. Not a move. You arrest her, Marshal. You saw it. Get up. Put, put him in jail now. I, I didn't touch him. Shut up. 
Now, you're just lucky you weren't killed. Now, you get out of here and stay away from Jim. It's his wedding day, and if I find you bothering him again, I'll throw you in jail. Now, go on, move. Fine. Fine, all we got around here, Maggie. Sorry to make trouble, Marshal, but I won't hold for his making that talk around Lila. Oh, forget it, Jim. Just keep clear of him for a while. Uh, what time's the wedding? Well, about three o'clock. At least that's when the preacher said he'd come down. It'll be at the church, won't it, Jim? Well, no. The preacher thought maybe it'd be better to do it somewhere else. It's uh, because of... Yeah, yeah, sure, Jim. Uh, you know, Dodge City House would be a fine place, wouldn't it? That's just what I'd plan, Marshal. Uh, I brought a jug of corn in with me in case anyone came around, maybe. <laughs> Jim, I wouldn't miss it for the world. I'm going to be there for sure. Yeah, me too, Jim. I certainly do enjoy a wedding. I never got married myself, but I sure do like to watch. <laughs> See you later, Jim. Sure, Marshal. It will be there, Jim. Bye. <laughs> Jim's bride, Lila, turned out to be a handsome, high-strung woman with nervous black eyes and a manner that bespoke a gentle breeding and background. I watched her, and I wondered how she'd ever make out in this crude, raw country she'd chosen to come to. It was never mentioned how she and Jim had got together, but the few friends who gathered for the wedding didn't care. We were all pleased that Jim finally had a wife to break the loneliness that he'd set upon himself for so long. And after the brief ceremony at the Dodge City House, we told him so. <laughs> well, it's about time, Jim. If you don't mind my saying so, ma'am, you should have filed on him long ago. Why, uh, yes, I, I mean, of, of course. Open the jug on the table there, Si. It's good corn. Well, thank you, Jim. My throat is a mite dusty. Help yourselves to the liquor, boys. Thank you. Thank you. Well, congratulations, Jim. And Miss Cobbett, my best wishes to you, ma'am. Thank you, Marshal Dillon. Now, you make Jim bring you to town and see us once in a while. <laughs> he never came in much when he was alone out there. Oh, I'm sure he will, Marshal. I, I sure hope so, ma'am. Help yourself to the jug there, Chester. Well, thank you, Jim. If I can get it away from Cy long enough, I will. <laughs> uh, you stay in here tonight, Jim? Well, no, Marshal. I brought the wagon on account of Lila here, and it's a slow way of travel. It'll take a day and a half at best. But where will we sleep tonight, Jim? Oh, I've got some blankets, Lila. We'll be fine. You mean out on the prairie? Well, sure. We'll bed down in the wagon if you're afraid of snakes. Oh, snakes can't get to you if you're in the wagon, ma'am. But, but what about everything else? Indians. No Indians have been seen around here for months. I don't oh, know. Oh, no, you're wrong, Jim. A man from Walnut Creek told me he ran into some Pawnees a couple weeks ago. Only about a dozen, though. Pawnees? Well, they didn't bother him, did they, Si? No, no, they didn't, Marshal. Yeah, you see, Lila? Well, they didn't bother him because he saw him first. He hid himself under a bank in the creek. Uh, are there many Indians around? Oh, no, very few, man. Well, the Army's been after him pretty steady ever since them crows raided the Gillette place. The engine's been making themselves scarce the last few months. What happened at the Gillette place? They had a little trouble, that's all, Lila. Little trouble to kill Bob and rode off of Mrs. Gillette and the child, that's all. Oh, no. Uh, Si, why don't you go get yourself another drink, huh? Mm, yeah, well, I was just thinking about doing that. Well, no, I suppose it'll be easier than Mrs. Gillette once she learns to talk crow. But still, it's a hard life on a white woman suddenly being made a squall. Oh. The uh, oh, jug's well. almost empty, Si. Yeah. You better hurry, huh? By golly, dear. Hey, fellas, I got another swatter coming up. Liquor's oh. working on Si, now. They don't pay no money. Jim, is it true what he said about that poor woman? Now, Lila, don't you fret about that. Is it true? I want to know, Jim. Yes. Uh, Jim, if you stayed in Dodge City tonight, well, you could start out before dawn tomorrow. Oh, maybe it'd... no, Marshal. Jim thinks it's best we leave tonight. There's nothing to fear, Lila, but if you'd rather stay, we can... No, we'll go, Jim. If you'll excuse me, I'll go change into something more suitable. Goodbye, Marshal. 
Goodbye, ma'am. We'll see you in Dodge City real soon, I hope. Of course. I'll be down shortly, Jim. Maybe it was best that way for Lila to face out her first night on the prairie not far from Dodge. Nothing would bother him at close to town and it would make it easier for her on the next night. And they left. And that's all we heard about him for oh, a month or so. Dodge City was fairly quiet except for one week when a Texas herd arrived. Two boys were killed the next night and another a few days after. But then things cooled off and became peaceable again. Hank Lewis is in town, Mr. Dillon. Oh, no, Chester. Well, there ought to be a law against it, that's all. He said he was coming here to see you in a few minutes. <clears throat> Look, you talk to him, Chester. I think I'll go upstairs and pick on the dock for a while. Oh, oh he doesn't want to see me, Mr. Dillon. I, I'll send him up when he comes. Uh, Chester, no. Yes, sir, but he'll ask me where you are, sir, and then what am I going to tell Marshal, him? Marshal, if... I want to talk to you. Well, all right, Hank. Go ahead, talk. You think I was lying about Jim Cobbett, don't you? Well, listen to this, Marshal. Lila's disappeared, too. What? I saw it with my own eyes. I mean, I saw she isn't there. What are you talking about, Hank? I'm telling you, Marshal, Lila's gone, just like Jim's first wife up on Hackberry Creek. She's plain disappeared. Well, go on. Well, I got a runny bay mare that's always running off, and I rode by Jim's place to see if he'd seen her. Jim was just sitting there, and he'd hardly pay me any mind at all. He was all alone, and when I asked him about Lila, he... He just walked off, wouldn't say a word. Well, maybe she was just out on the prairie somewhere. Then she stayed a long time. I was back next day and still didn't see her. Stock's gone, too. When was this, Hank? About a week ago. Now, Marshal, I think you ought to get I out... I do my own thinking, Hank. Well, all right. But you better get out there, Marshal. I've told you now. Yeah, you've and... told me, and you can forget it. Just stay away from the Cobbett place, you understand? All right, Marshal, I've done my duty. You better do yours. Goodbye, Hank. Well, I... Goodbye. What are you going to do, Mr. Dillon? Only thing we can do, Chester. Go settle our horses, will you? I got some things to clean up around here. Yes, Mr. Dillon. doings at all Plymouth dealers. Tomorrow, go in and meet the new Plymouth, the new kind of low-priced car. And enter the big $25,000 Meet the New Plymouth contest. All you do is look her over, compare, ask questions. There'll be people on hand to explain the new body design, new type suspension, new springing, how they combine to give you a ride that's unbelievably smooth. The first truly balanced ride in the low-priced field. Believe me, you'll be enthusiastic. So just transfer that enthusiasm in 50 words or less to a contest entry blank. Tell what you like most about the new, truly balanced Plymouth for 53. That's all there is to it. And you may win a 53 Plymouth or one of hundreds of cash prizes. But entries must be mailed by Monday midnight. So hurry, get an official entry blank containing all the easy rules tomorrow when you go in to meet the new 53 Plymouth. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. Sure looks quiet around here, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. Yeah, come on. They're probably inside. You think Lyle is here, don't you, sir? I will soon find out, Chester. Hello, Jim. Hello, Marshal. Chester? Hello, Jim. Come in. (laughs) 
have you been, Jim? Hank Lou's told you, didn't he, Marshal? Where is she, Jim? Hank Lou said I killed her, didn't he, Marshal? Oh, now, Jim, you know I don't pay any attention to what Hank Lou says. Then why'd you come here, Marshal? To help you. If you're in trouble. Lila isn't here. And I'm in trouble, all right. Well, what happened, Jim? Where is she? I don't know. What? Well, Injuns, party of crows, they took her. They, they, they took her. Injuns? My goodness. You mean you were raided here? Maybe ten days ago, a war party, about twelve crows. Well, what happened? Well, Lila was out there by the spring. It was just getting dark, and I was sitting on the floor right there. Men in the saddle I'd torn the stirrup off of when I heard her come running up the path out back. She'd all in the sweat and yelling. Lila, what is it? Oh, I saw something out there. Oh, Jim. Jim, I think it was an Indian. Come inside. Get on, get on the floor in the corner there. How many? How many did you see? Oh, just him. I saw his skin behind that little rise. Oh, Jim, don't let him get me. Easy now, Lila. Oh, oh. I don't see a thing out of this window. Take a look over here. Nothing. I must have heard you yell. Oh, Jim, what will we do? Stand them off, that's all. Wait a minute, there's one. Oh, no. Getting hard to see. Jim, the other side. They'll sneak up on the other side. Might be one behind that log out there. Oh, no. Just wait. Oh. They'll get bolder in the dark. I can pick them off easy. Oh, Jim. Jim, they'll carry me off like they did that other woman. I can't stand it, Jim. Here. <laughs> take that six year Yeah, Yeah, I will. I will. It won't take you while I'm alive. Oh. I promise you that, Lila. <laughs> wait a minute. They're down at the corral. Oh, no. They're after oh. our horses. Oh. Oh. That'll show them. Here he goes. There was one behind that log. Oh, Jim, I can't stand it. They're sneaking up on us. Now we'll just wait. Let them get in the open. Oh. Wait till a, a little more. Then when they jump and run on us, I... Oh. oh. Go on, Jim. What happened then? Yeah. What did they do when they rushed you? Well, one of them must have got in the window behind me. When Lila screamed, I was knocked out. And when I come to, the engine was gone. Lila was gone, too. Were you shot, Jim, or what? No. The engine must have got behind me somehow and clubbed me, that's all. Did you try to follow him? How could I, Marshal? They run off the horses, stole them. Yeah, I see. Anyway, I was out a long time. There wasn't a sign of anybody when I come to. Well, they could be in the Rocky Mountains by now. We'd never find them. Uh, I'll report this to Colonel Jenkins of Fort Dodge, and he can spread the word through the Army Post. Thanks, Marshal. I, uh, I'm sorry, Jim. But I guess that's all I can do for you. Sure, Marshal. Uh, come on, Chester. Let's uh, take a look around outside and then get back to Dodge City. Yes, sir. So long, Jim. I sure I am sorry it happened. So long. Jim's pretty broke up, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. That's terrible. And her a squaw now. Yeah. yeah. My, aren't those pretty, Mr. Dillon? What? Hey, that bunch of columbine there, growing right in a row. <laughs> I think I'll just put one in my hat. No, uh, wait a minute, Chester. Huh? I, uh, I, I wouldn't pick them, Chester. They're, they're too pretty to pick, huh? Well, all right, sir. Jim's stock is gone, all right. Mm-hmm. You know, Mr. Dillon, Jim Cobbett ain't the luckiest man in the world, is he? No, he sure isn't, Chester. Come on, let's get out of here. It was 
the day after we got back to Dodge City that the trouble started, as I expected it would. Chester spread the story about the Indians kidnapping Lila Cobbett, and it wasn't long before some of the men began to question it. And a group of them, headed, of course, by Hank Luz, came to see me. Marshal, we want to know when you're going to arrest him. Hank, it'd be better if you'd let somebody else do the talking. Your record against Jim Cobbett's pretty strong. Marshal's right, Hank. You always did talk too much anyway. I want justice done, that's all, and I mean to get it. Oh, shut up, oh, Hank. Hey. Marshal Hank sort of talked us into thinking you don't need to do anything about Jim Cobbett. Is that true? Well, what's your idea, Merrick? Well, go out there and arrest him and find Lila's body if you can. You think Jim murdered her, is that it? Looks that way. You sure don't believe his story, do you, Marshal? No. Not all of it. Jim did her in just like his first wife. That's what. It's a sure thing, Marshal. No engines would have stolen the woman left Jim lying there without scalping him. Engine's just being made that way. Merritt, I don't know what happened out there, but I'm going to find out. Then what are you waiting for, Marshal? The doc. The doc? What's he got to do with this? Well, Miss Prillifew had a baby this morning. The doc was up all night, and he's sleeping today. We're going to ride out to Jim's tomorrow. Well, I don't know what you need the doc for, but we'll wait and ride out with you. You won't ride anywhere, Hank. When I need a posse, I'll ask for it. I don't want a single man of you anywhere near the Cobbett place. Is that clear? All right, now get out of here. I got work to do. It's a mighty lonely looking place, Matt. Uh, yeah, indeed. I wonder what Lila Cobbett thought when she first saw it. She must have been mighty fond of Jim to come here at all, seems to me. Yeah. Well, I hope Jim's still there. Uh, isn't that him there? Uh, down by the corral there, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. He's got a new horse. Oh, oh. oh. <coughs> Hello, Jim. What are you doing here, Doc? I had to bring the doc, Jim, to perform a sort of autopsy. Autopsy? On Miss Cobbett. It's necessary, Jim, or I wouldn't do it. Marshal? Now, don't do it, Jim. You wouldn't have a chance. No. Take his gun, Chester. Yes, sir. All right, Jim, let's you and me go on into the house, huh? I don't imagine you want to watch this. Well, um, well, where is it, Matt? You want to tell him, Jim? Over there, under that row of columbines. Well, I'll... So, that's why you wouldn't let me pick any, Mr. Dillon. I watered the ground a lot to make it hard. It was a good job, Jim. Come on, let's go in the house. Shovel's out back of the corral. I'll get it. Well, all that water and it didn't do any good. In the house, Jim sat with his back to the wall, his hands clasped tightly across his knees. He was so gaunt and leathery that I wondered if he'd bothered to eat anything at all since this had happened. He just sat there as if waiting to be sentenced and not caring very much one way or the other. Finally, Doc and Chester were finished and they came into the house. We put her back, Jim. Right where you had her. Yeah. And it wasn't easy, Matt. Yeah, I know. But what did you find? Well, she was killed by a forty-five. Fired at close range. Bullet entered her head just under... Never her. mind, Doc. Jim's gun here is a forty-five, Mr. Dillon. Well, you want to tell us about it, Jim? You think I killed her, Marshal? Well, it looks that way, Jim. But I still can't believe it. Thank you, Marshal. If you did it, Jim, you're going to hang for it. The crows didn't attack the house, Marshal. They never aimed to. 
They just dodged around out there, some of them, to cover for the ones that ran the stock off. They didn't want to fight, just to stock. Yeah, it's happened before. Lila screamed and screamed. I guess she went kind of crazy. Then I heard a shot. First I thought she was shooting at the engines. Then I saw her on the floor there. I didn't care after that. They could have come right in there. They could have done anything they wanted. I didn't care. You, uh... You had given her your six-gun, is that it? Yes. The crows didn't bother you after that? They just took the horses and left? I didn't care about them. I buried Lila out there right away. And I sat there on the ground all night. Everything had been all right, Marshal, but when Hank Luz came by, I got scared. I didn't want to talk to him, but I knew what he'd say. So, I put water on the grave and tried to hide it, except for the flowers I'd planted. I just couldn't not have planted flowers there. He's telling the truth, Matt. Yeah, Jim isn't lying. No, no, sir, he certainly isn't. Neither. There's no reason I know of why Jim should stand trial. What about Hank Lewis, Mr. Dillon? He'll make trouble. Now, the three of us here have heard the story and seen the evidence. Hank's talk doesn't mean a thing. I, I have no cause to arrest Jim. Then I can go, Marshal. Go? Go where? I don't want to live here anymore. It's like the other place up north after my first wife rode off. She just said goodbye and... Rode off one day. I was ashamed of that, so I never told nobody what happened. And I left the place. I come leaving this one. Well, you got to settle down sometime, Jim. No, no, I don't. I got bad luck both places. I won't settle down no more. We won't stop you, Jim. Well, I think I'll go now, Marshal. I don't want to spend another night here. I'll get my things together. Yeah. Uh, we'll wait outside. Come on, Chester. Doc. A half hour later, Jim was packed and ready to go. Silently, he shook hands with each one of us and then mounted and rode off. Yeah, the prairie had dealt hard with Jim Covet, but the man was too tough and dry not to survive somehow. He wouldn't try again to be happy, but he'd live. He'd make his way. We watched him disappear while the sun went and the land cooled and became still and quiet. Plymouth contest closes Monday midnight. Your last chance to win a new 53 Plymouth free or a big cash prize. Go to your nearby Plymouth dealers tomorrow. Meet the new Plymouth. Look it over stem to stern. Ask questions. Find out all about this new kind of low-priced car. Then, on an official entry blank in 50 words or less, tell what you like most about this great new beauty. But remember, entries must be mailed by Monday midnight. So be sure to visit your Plymouth dealers tomorrow to pick up your contest entry blank and meet the new 53 Plymouth. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John McIntyre and Jeanette Nolan. With Paul Dubov, Jack Crucian, and Harry Bartell. Harley Bear is Chester and Howard McNear is Doc. Gunsmoke was brought to you by Plymouth. Along with a reminder that you visit your Plymouth dealer tomorrow and enter the Meet the New Plymouth contest. 
Remember, entries must be mailed before Monday midnight. Clancy Cassell speaking. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. This morning, Mr. Bumby. Huh? Oh, hello, Marshal. <laughs> Morning, Mr. Dillon. Morning, Sam. Is uh, Kitty around? Oh, don't know she's up yet, but if she is, she ought to be down soon. <laughs> oh, I'll wait. Nippy this morning. Oh, feels good. It's a nice time of year, huh? Uh, I don't know. I, I kind of like spring myself. Uh, Sam. You better wash that glass over. Hmm? Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, can I get you something? Beer, maybe? Uh, got any coffee? Sure. Just made a pot. Oh, that'll be fine. Her face is something wondrous. That's pretty, man. <laughs> you got a pretty voice. Oh, it is. Good enough for calling hogs, I guess. <laughs> yeah. you, you just get up? A while ago. Why? Oh, it, it just strikes me I haven't seen you close too early like this. Uh-huh. No, no, I, I, you look fine. I, I, oh, I, mean, I mean that you... You better quit by your head. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's... Where's Sam? Oh, he's bringing in coffee. Oh, Sam, cup for me, please. Sure, Miss Kitty. What's the occasion, Matt? Uh... Kitty, uh, there's a party tomorrow night, a dance. It's a benefit for the new school down at the hall, you know. <laughs> and uh, ever fellows to bring a girl, y you know. <laughs> it happens at dances. Go on. Well, uh, what I'm trying to... Will you go uh, with me? I'd kind of like to, Matt, but no thanks. Oh. Well, I gotta work here. You know that. Besides... Well, you I... ought to be able to get off. Well, even if I could, ladies might not take kindly to it, Matt. I'm not rightly polite society. Ah, what do you care about? What the... Well, thanks anyway, Matt. Ah, that smells wonderful. Sammy, I think I'll marry you. <laughs> Me? <laughs> shucks. <laughs> Me? Oh, shucks. <laughs> Uh, listen, Kitty, about the dance, I, I've already bought the you're, tickets. You're sweet, Matt, and I thank you kindly for thinking of me, but you better ask someone else. Well, it, it isn't... Ki Sam, will, will you go and polish up your glasses, please? Hmm? Oh, sure, Mr. Dillon, sure. Mm -hmm. Now, look, Kitty, I'm asking you to go with me. It, well, it's important to me that you go. Are you making love to me, Matt? At this hour in the morning? No, no I, I mean it. I I want you to go to the dance. You want to be embarrassed. You want everyone to stare at us. You know what they'll say? My, my, the marshal really should have better sense than to bring that woman here. It ain't decent. It ain't proper. <laughs> okay. Well, it's true. <laughs> I'm a hostess at the Texas Trail, a, a saloon. You know what they think about me. Well, I... Will you go, Kitty? No. 
I'll call by for you at seven, huh? I'll drink a bottle of whiskey and clout some old biddy on the head. Then you'll be sorry. Oh, Kitty. I haven't got anything to wear, Matt. I can't wear my work and clothes. You look just fine, like you are, Kitty. Just fine, just like you are. Marshal. Yeah. I shouldn't, but I guess I'll go to the dance with you. <laughs> I'll be ready at seven. How do you talk about a woman like Kitty? The color of her hair, eyes, the shape of her leg, the way she spoke, thought. Well, that's a picture you had to get by looking and hearing. Otherwise, you, you'd never know it. And I felt real good about taking Kitty to the party. The first time we'd really be out in company. And I liked the idea. Morning, Mr. Dillon. Good morning, Chester. Nice day. What is that? That, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, all over my desk, that. Ink. Yes, sir, I know. I, I was just cleaning it up, Mr. Dillon. Seems like a big blue bottle fly, last of his kind this fall, I guess. Big cool blue bottle fly was a setting on your desk, Mr. Dillon. Oh, you're slopping it all over the floor, Chester. Yes, sir, I see it. That lazy fool blue bottle fly was a stomping all over your desk, Mr. Dillon, and I took a whack at him with a paper I happened to have in my hand, and I got him. Well, thanks a lot. Well, that's all right, Mr. Dillon. If there's anything in this world I hate, it's a big maggoty blue bottle yeah, fly. Yeah, 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 I know, Chester. Uh, the mail come in yet? Yes, sir. A couple of minutes ago. It's right over there. Oh, okay. Uh... There. I think that should do it, Mr. Dillon. All right, Chester. Anything likely in the mail, Mr. Dillon? No, no. Uh, look, Chester, uh, we better get these government circulars posted. Uh, would you do that for me? Yes, sir, I'll do that. Uh, say, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, what is it, Chester? About the dance tomorrow. Now, what about it? Well, you're going, aren't you, sir? Doc's going. He's taking Ms. McNish. I I'm going. Everybody's going. You are going, aren't you, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, I'm going. Don't seem right, a man. You're standing not to go to a big social like we're... You are? Yes. Well, that's fine. Just fine. Doc and, and me, we were talking, and it just didn't seem right to us that a man like you didn't have no real nice sweet girl to escort to a big social. I got one, Chester. A real nice sweet girl. I'm taking Kitty. Miss Kitty? I asked her before I came down, and she accepted. Well, that's good, Miss Kitty. Uh, that's right, Chester. Uh, I uh, got to get a couple of letters off to Washington, Chester. You you want to go and see about posting those circulars, huh? Yes, Mr. Dillon. Ah, fine. Uh, uh, Dillon? Yes. Oh, what is it, Chester? Well, Mr. Dillon, it it ain't none of my business, and I, I did not have no right to say it. Say what? Well, sir, I... I... Yeah? I was wondering if I might borrow one of them fancy ties off you for the party. That's not your business. That's what you haven't got any right to say. Yes, sir. No, that's right. You're a liar, Chester. But you can borrow a tie. I thank you kindly, Mr. Dillon. You work for a long time with a man, and you share a lot of life and a lot of death. And after a while, you... You know him even better than yourself. Well, that's the way it is with Chester and with me. Now, he had something on his mind, and I figured after a while he'd get it off. Well, the morning went, and it was almost noon when Chester came back. 
Gonna go have some dinner, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, I think I will. How about you? Hungry as a raggle-bone possum. <laughs> Did you get the posters up? Yes, sir. Well, okay, let's go. Uh, Mr. Dillon? Yeah. I guess there's something you ought to know, sir. There's talk. Yeah. All right, Chester, come on, get it out. It's all over town. About you taking Miss Kitty to the dance tomorrow night. What do you mean, all over town? I only asked her this morning. Yes, sir, I know. Best I can figure, Sam over at the Texas Trail must have heard you and let it slip. There's been a mighty fierce mess of gum clobbering up and down all over. All right. Uh, thanks for telling me, Chester. It ain't none of my business. Yeah, I know. You said that before. Yes, sir. I surely did. Well, let's go get something to eat. It's hard to tell about people. Maybe it's hard to tell about yourself because you come under that same heading, people. And when they're mean and small, there's not an animal to touch them. Chester and I walked down the street, and it didn't take long to hear and see what was going on. Some of the drifters leaning against the wall on the corner came right out with it. Morning, Marshal. I understand there's a gal in town's got herself a new boat. What did you say? <laughs> Maybe you ought to look into it, Marshal. Folks are being downright rude. Mister, you're gonna... Come on, Chester. <laughs> <laughs> Ought to haul him in. Ever one. Yeah. What are you going to charge him with? Pestilence, Mr. Dillon. Just plain pestilence. I knew better what Kitty had meant about the ladies of the town when a couple came out of Olivet's dry goods store. He didn't see me until it was I'm too late. I'm to the dance committee. It's indecent, that's what it is, why she's come. Nothing but a common saloon woman. What's this city coming to when a United States Marshal... Ooh. Morning, Miss Sprinkle. Uh. <laughs> when a man's born, they, they say he's blessed or cursed with a lot of things already in him. Take pride, for instance. Sometimes pride can be a curse. Well, maybe I had more in my share. Maybe it would have been a sight kinder if I'd not taken Kitty the dance. But I did. Turn for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, this hint for weekend driving. Whatever you do, be moderate. Be obedient to all traffic laws. Be careful. Use your head and don't take chances. Now for the second act of Gunsmoke. I picked up Kitty at the Texas Trail at 7 the next evening. She was waiting by the side door, and when I saw her, she kind of moved back in the shadows, almost as though she was ashamed for me to see her. Hi. Hello, Matt. Are you all set? Well, I guess so. Uh, Matt, are you sure? Hey, you... Kitty, you look fine. Yeah, you look just fine. <laughs> Do you like it? Yeah. Yeah, I like it. We walked along the street down to the hall, and I, I kept looking at her like, like I say, you know, you, you, you had to know this, Kitty, to understand what I mean, and <laughs> even then you get a surprise. 
She was like a 17-year-old on her first date, and she was like all the women you'd ever known and loved, soft and innocent. And something else, something that's female and you can't figure out what, something that makes you drunk without a drink inside you. It was snowing a little, and the flakes caught in her hair and melted into the black of her velvet cloak. And just before we went in, I looked at her again. And I didn't care. I, I was proud she was with me. Oh, evening, Marshal Dillon. Evening, Miss Murphy. Uh, you know Miss Russell? I do. You have your tickets, Marshal Dillon? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, here we are. Fine. Uh, go right in, won't you? Oh, sure. Oh, uh, excuse me, Mrs. Murphy. Is there somewhere I can put my cloak? Oh, uh, uh, yes, yes, of course. Um, the ladies' reception room is right through there. I, I didn't catch the name. Catherine Russell, ma'am. Excuse me, ma'am. Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll wait for you. Thanks. You better... I could see them through the big open doors in the hall. They were all there. Faces flushed, smiling, happy, dancing. And all the women seemed pretty and the men handsome. And Chester was up on the platform calling the dance and Doc was fiddling. And I was waiting for my dancing partner, Miss Kitty Russell. took you so long. I'm sorry, Matt. I had a skirmish with one of the genteel females in there. Oh, I'm sorry. Why so she? <laughs> you know, I get the idea I'm not welcome around here. Uh, uh, let's go in and get some punch, huh? Sure. <laughs> How are you, John? <laughs> oh, that's a nice dress, Kitty. Well, I haven't worn it since a few years back in New Orleans. Hey, Marshal. Oh, Miss Kitty. Let's oh, talk. Well, hi. Oh, fine, Doc. Hello, Doc. <laughs> I say, <clears throat> say, we got a bottle of whiskey outside. You care to join it? <laughs> oh, this punch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not right now, thank you, Doc. Oh, well, sure. Hey, Miss Kitty, I saw you come in. Best looking woman in here. <laughs> oh, there's lots of scratching going on. <laughs> thank you, Doc. <laughs> if you see Mrs. Magnish, don't tell her where I am, will you? Man gets kind of dry, fiddling. Oh, I'm so long. So long, Doc. Punch, Marshal Dillon? Uh, Kitty? I guess so. Uh, Mr. Sprinkle, have you met Miss Catherine Russell? Uh, no, no, I'm afraid I haven't. You got a short memory, Mr. Sprinkle. Huh? I could have swore it was you in the Texas Trail a couple of weeks back. Drunk or no hoot owl. Don't you remember I had to slap your face? Uh, I, I think... Edward? Well, I, it, Edward? Yes, dear. You let somebody else take care of the punch. I want you to come with oh, me. Oh, well, no, I mean, I, I promised. I, I'm, I'm on the committee. Even, Miss Sprinkle. I have no wish to speak to you, Marshal Dillon, or this woman you've brought with you. I will not have my husband serving such people. Aren't you being a trifle bad-mannered, Miss Sprinkle? How dare you say that? Well, aren't you? I suggest that you leave, Marshal. Emmy. You're not wanted here. Not with that woman you've seen fit to bring. Come on, Matt. I want to go. No. This is a public dance, Miss Sprinkle. Right now, you're trying to make it private. If you can't behave like a lady, I'll thank you to leave this lady's presence. What? Now, see here, Marshal. You can't talk like that to my wife. Hey, Kitty! What do you say, Kitty? Hmm. Matt, please. I want to go. We're not going anywhere. We're staying. Uh, 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 how about some music? All right, all right now, folks. It'll be a waltz this time. Waltz! 
Thanks for the punch, Mr. Sprinkle. Come on, Kitty. I warned you, man. Now, please, will you take me out of here before something happens? Nothing's going to happen, Kitty. You and me are going to dance. Have a good time. That's all. You're acting like a kid. Matt, it won't work. I've seen this kind of thing before. May I have this dance, Miss Kitty? Please, Matt. You're being pig-headed and you know it. Let's get out. You're refusing me, Miss Kitty? Oh, Matt. We danced. But it wasn't what I hoped it would be. Kitty closed her eyes. I guess she was trying to blot it out, but... I could see the other couples looking, whispering, and one by one dropping away over into a small group that got larger. There were only about six of us left when the wall ended. That's when the stranger and a couple of his pals walked out onto the floor. They were drifters, probably been in town for a week, and they were having their fun before they moved on. Marshal... I got a painful duty. Yeah? Uh, folks in this town seem real upset about you bringing that mm, woman in here. Yeah. What's your name? Oh, I'm just a fella. I kind of made myself and my friends here a committee of three, seeing as how everything's done by committees here. And we, <laughs> yeah, we figured it would be best if you take your... Um, Friend, home. Mister, I'm the marshal in Dodge Matt, City, and I... I'm leaving. You're staying here, Kitty. She's smarter than you, Marshal. Everything all right? Everything's Mr. fine, Chester. Now, this ain't a matter of law, you know, Marshal. It's decency and, and what's right. Yeah, so. Marshal, this ain't right. Mister, I'm taking this badge off. Chester, you stay here with Kitty. Matt, don't you do it. Now, come Matt. on outside. You... We're going to talk some more about this out there. Ah, oh, it's cold outside. Now, you be a good fella and get out of where you ain't wanted. You know I won't hit you in here, don't you? Were you thinking of doing that, Marshal? Now, that ain't lawful. I ain't done nothing. Kitty. Kitty, wait. Now, now there's a gal with sense. All right, man. mister. Now, I'm telling you. You and your pals are going to have to come out sooner or later, and when you do, you better start hightailing it out of Dodge before I catch up with you. We'll think of that. Oh, sure. We sure will, <laughs> Marshal. Just three no-good drifters, hating the law, finding pleasure in trouble. Kitty had gone, and I went out into the street. It had stopped snowing. Just cold. Much colder. I went up to the Texas Trail. There was only two people in there. Some guy dead drunk on a table, and someone else standing at the bar looking into the mirror at me. Well, you haven't, Mr. Dillon. Nothing, sir. Yeah. Well, I, I, I got some things to do in the back. You, you give me a call if anyone comes in, will you? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry, kid. Shut up. I, I'm sorry. I'm... Bad. Bad. Oh, Kitty. Oh, it's all right. Sure, it's all right. I'm so mad. I, I could... Yeah, I know. I, know. I should have known better. No, it, it was me, not you. No, I wasn't that either. It was all those polite ladies and gentlemen. Give me a kerchief, will you? Yeah, here. Mm. 
been a long time since I cried. Yeah, sure. It wasn't so much for me. For you. I, want, I wanted to cry right there in the hall. Watching you and knowing there was nothing you could do. Nice mess of people we got in the Dodge. No, it's not them, Matt. It's me. I've run into this before. The only difference was I didn't have you around. I wanted it to be right tonight because of you. A lot of narrow-minded prayer spouting. Yeah. They hurt your pride, didn't they? No. No, it, it wasn't that. No. No, I... I wanted you to go with me. That made me real happy. But maybe we're different, Matt. You and me figure life different to them. That's not their fault. There's a lot of folks there I know. I... I smile at them on the street. They talk to me. But tonight, well, that was different. I made them uncomfortable. Yeah. Oh, well, I didn't do a bad job with you. Oh, well, you can't look at it that way. And you can't go fighting the whole town either. There's three fellas going to get hurt. No, I don't want you to do, the, do that, Matt. You just let it go. Let it go, Matt. They don't mean nothing. You know what means something to me? What? That you asked me to go to the dance with you. I knew what was going to happen, but it was worth the chance. I thank you for it, Matt. You're a funny one. Am I? <laughs> but you sure showed them up, those women. <laughs> the way you look. Well, I'm glad. <laughs> you know, you look pretty fine yourself. Sam! Yeah? Uh... You got any champagne, Sam? What? Have I got any what? Champagne. Well, yeah. I guess maybe. A bottle or two? Yeah, maybe. Sure. Well, break it out. All right. Miss Kitty? I think the next dance is mine. Oh, Matt. I'd be real pleased, Mr. Dillon. Gunsmoke. Under the direction of Norman MacDonald stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Anthony Ellis, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Vivi Janis, Bob Sweeney, Lawrence Dobkin, and Mary Lansing. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNair is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. <laughs> Don't miss Robert Trout and his timely roundup of world news tomorrow on most of these same CBS radio stations. Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, Amos and Andy are here every Sunday on the CBS radio network.
around Dodge City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with the U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Everything was all right until about a mile north of the Cimarron. That's when my horse got a hoof caught in a frozen dog hole and broke his leg. So I had to shoot him. It made me feel awful bad. I didn't feel any better thinking about the walk ahead of me. Close to 40 miles to dodge and carry in my saddle all the way. I guess I'd been on the trail about an hour, near as I could figure it was around three in the afternoon. And I'd ease the saddle off my shoulders for a rest and a smoke. And that's when I saw the stranger riding up from the way I'd come. He was tall and thin. And his horse was taller and even thinner. And they made quite a pair. Hi. How are you? You lost? No. No. My horse busted his leg away back. I'm on my way to Dodge. Oh, it's your horse, huh? I saw it. Yeah. On your way to Dodge, huh? Yeah? yeah, that's right. Uh, you got any more of that tobacco? Yeah, sure. Uh, here you are. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. Man. That's okay. Kind of a big walk you've got ahead, ain't it? <laughs> Kind of. It's going to be dark soon. You figure making camp? Ah, that's the idea. Uh-huh. Well, it's too bad. Yeah. Do you need any food? No, 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 thanks. I, I got enough. Uh-huh. Well, I thank you for the tobacco. Sure. Anytime. Hey. The yeah? arm? Not saying this beast won't drop dead from the shock, but do you want to climb on behind? Save your piece of boot leather for a while, anyway. Well, I, I'd be much obliged if you think that animal of yours can carry us. Well, she won't mind. Should have been dead a long time ago, except she don't know it. She don't mind. Well, okay, thanks. Uh, here, will you hold my saddle till I get up, huh? Yeah, give it to you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Can you manage the saddle? Yeah, I give it. Uh, yeah, I got it. Now yeah, let's go. You heading for Dodge too? Not in particular. Just north. Uh huh. This beast will do about ten knots with the wind behind her, but we ain't going to get more than five with this load. You ain't in no hurry, I am. Well, I. <laughs> I was kind of hoping to get back tonight. It's a Christmas Eve, you know. Oh, yeah, that's right, isn't it? Yeah. That backbone of hers sticking into you? Oh, no, it's okay. Thanks. Notice that tin doojigger tied to you. You with the law? Yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm a U.S. Marshal. Uh, my name's Matt Dillon. That's so... Uh, Never seen a marshal on foot. <laughs> well, it happens sometimes. How is it you're down this way? And it might off your course? Mm hmm. So you marshal down here as well as Dodge? No, no. I, I just took a prisoner across the Cimarron into Oklahoma Territory. Turned him over to the Army there. Did. And then he shot up tight. We must have ridden a couple of miles without a word. I got to thinking about Dodge and Chester and Doc and Kitty and the rest of them. You know, there's something pretty special about any place at Christmas time. 
the backbone of the stranger's nag was just about to split me in two when he talked up. My name is Cowley. Oh? Amos Cowley. Uh, a bit of heave to a spell. She's breathing mighty hard. All right, hold up. Yes. Ah. <clears throat> yeah, it's getting a little chilly, isn't it? Yeah. Um, could I trouble you for another smoke? Oh, sure, sure. Here you are. I thank you. Say, hmm? what's it like in Dodge? What? Dodge. What's it like? <laughs> oh, it's like any other town, I guess. <laughs> Pretty big, huh? Well, yeah, I, I guess so. Not so big as New York, though. Oh, oh no, 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 not as big as that. You know, I haven't been in a big town now for more than ten years. Oh, is that so? No. Been down the territories, drifting. Thought I'd move up north this time, maybe go back east. Now you're from the east, huh? Some time back. Say, what's it like? What? Well, Dodge, any town, uh, at Christmas. Same as it used to be? Well, I guess so. Uh, what do you do? Well, same as most people, I guess. What most people do at Christmas. Well, that ain't saying a lot. What are the folks like? And what does it look like? I, I just... I just kind of like to know. Well, I, I don't know. Uh, well, there's Front Street, uh... That's most of Dodge right now. Of course, it's getting bigger all the time. Do you time. have any kids? No, no, I, I'm not married. Yeah. Kids have fun Christmas. Yeah, yeah, they do. That, that's certain. And Dodge, they sometimes have a party for the kids. A couple of days before Christmas. Uh, kids like that. And then everybody gets feeling good, looking forward to Christmas Eve. Like last year. There was snow on the ground, but the sky was clear. You, you could even see the stars. I was going down the street to the Texas Trail to meet Doc and Chester. Uh, Chester, he's my deputy. Doc's a doctor in town. We had some work to do later on in the evening. You could uh, see the light shining behind the curtained windows, and almost everybody had a sprig of holly berries hanging up. They got some from the east a couple of days earlier. I... I remember running into John Bumby. He's a kind of general handyman in Dodge. Never says much, but <laughs> he sure had a lot to say that night. Oh, hello, Marshal. Oh, hi, John. <clears throat> a lovely night for a Christmas Eve, isn't it? Yeah, it certainly is, John. Yeah. Pretty fine night. Peace on earth. Goodwill to men. <laughs> Mr. Dillon? Yeah, that's the way it should be, John. Um... You know, Marshal, this is going to be quite a night for me. Yes, sir. Oh, is that oh, so? Oh, yes, sir. Tonight, I'm asking Mrs. McNish to become Mrs. Bumby. What? Mm -hmm. Why, John, I didn't know that. Oh, I know. It's been a mighty fast secret, but I, I'm popping the question tonight. Well, oh. I wish you a lot of luck, John. Hey, I'll I tell you what. Come by to the Texas Trail later and... And we'll have a drink on it. Oh, I will. I really will, Marshal. <laughs> You're good and kind, Marshal. Good and kind. Merry Christmas, <laughs> Marshal Dillon. Merry Christmas. Well, the same to you, John. That may sound kind of funny to you, but John Bumby's a good man. A little peculiar sometimes, but good as they come. And they don't make enough like him. Of course, most everybody in Dodge suspected Doc and Ms. McNish were sweet on each other. But it just goes to show you. Uh, I'll tell you about John and Ms. McNish a little later. So I went on down the street. You know, it's a funny thing about those words, Merry Christmas. Men say it to each other and, well, it makes them feel kind of good. Yeah, I know what you mean. Used to be a seafaring man myself. When you're on the sea and it comes Christmas, things like that can... They can count a lot. Yeah. Well, we might as well get underway again, huh? Sure. Yeah. All right. Hey. 
You want to take my yep. saddle? Give it here. Okay. Uh, All right. Give it to me. Okay. Come. I guess. I guess you'll miss it in Dodge tonight. I mean, won't you? Well, if you could get a little more out of this nag of yours, we might make it tonight. Oh, there's not a chance. She'll be on her beam ends pretty quick. She's been on a long reach since sunup. Ah. Mighty bare country up this way. All right. Depends on what you're used to, I well, Mighty bare where I've been, too. It's not like the sea. That's always different. How come you left it? I always heard a sailor doesn't ever get it out of his blood. Or the sea? <laughs> I guess you can get it out of your blood, all right. You got the right reason you can. Yeah, I guess so. Hey. You trying to get something out of me? But, well, no. Get what? I, I would just remind you. want to ride with me? I don't want any talk about the sea. Well, you brought it up. <laughs> I get it. Turn for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, tomorrow night, Jack Benny and his whole fun-making gang make a personal appearance at a Long Beach, California veterans' hospital. It's going to be a Christmas they'll never forget, as Benny and the bunch cut loose while they assist the folks at the hospital in trimming their Christmas tree. Be sure to join the fun tomorrow night on CBS Radio when it's Jack Benny time all across America. Now for the second act of Gunsmoke. Amos Cowley sulked his way along the trail for the next while. And then it was almost like he couldn't stand the quiet. Or maybe he had things on his mind. He turned his head. Go on. What? Go on. Tell me some more. Oh, about Dodge? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. Well, you try some more. Well, uh... They got a little pine tree in the Texas a Trail. Tree. Yeah, I come down a long way from the north. Uh, uh, Kitty Russell, she she's a hostess in the Texas Trail. Well, she she got a lot of ribbon and gewgaws and made it look real nice. Uh, that was last Christmas. Have a star at the top. A star? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. It looked like a star, I guess. <laughs> it sure looked pretty. And there was a well, a, a a difference in the place that day. Everybody was celebrating and feeling real good. The doors would swing open and somebody would come in and, you know, maybe somebody you just knew to nod at, but because it was Christmas Eve, he'd come right up and say, hello. Oh, maybe that's a good reason, maybe not. I don't know. All right, I'll tell you. Anyhow, it was still kind of early. Kitty and Chester were standing off looking at the tree. Hi, Matt. Good evening, Mr. Dillon. Hi, Kitty. Chester. How do you like it, Matt? Christmas tree. That's oh, yours. that's real pretty. Only tree but one in the whole town. Yeah, Kate's got one over the Alphaganza. Oh, well, I'll have to see it later. Sure, you're next. Where, where's Sam? I don't know. Maybe he started celebrating too soon. Oh. Doc's taking over the bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. You, you want a drink, Kitty? Yeah. Sure. All yeah. oh, right, I'll get you a drink. I'll get you a drink. Uh, you haven't forgotten anything, have you, Mr. Dillon? Forgotten? Uh, uh, what, Chester? Uh, there. What did I tell you, Miss Kitty? I knew just as sure as my nose that oh, you forgot. Oh, that. No, no. I, I hadn't forgotten. Oh. Well, I, I thought as soon as they get Sam sober enough to take care of the customers, we could go on over to Doc's like we planned. Sure, we'll do that, Chester. Here you are, Matt. Ah, thanks, Doc. Ah, oh. <laughs> yeah, well, it's still snowing out? No, no, it's not. Uh, well, where are you going, Kitty? All right. Just want to look outside. Oh, real 
Purdy. Man thinks of a lot of funny things that don't mean much. Kitty standing at the door, sniffing the cold air, and the warmth inside, and the whiskey in me. It, it, it was a good feeling. And then Chester and I decided to take a bottle over to Mr. Hightower. He's the telegraph operator over at the depot. He runs a printing shop on the side. Say, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, Chester. Do you mind if I stop by the church for a minute? Well, no, I don't mind. I just feel kind of right tonight, Mr. Dillon. Figure out to thank somebody for it. Sure. So we stop by the church. I've never been much of a man for a church, I guess, but I went along with Chester. There wasn't anybody else there, just the two of us. Guess we sat for ten minutes in that place. Chester a little way off with his head bowed. You know, there's a lot of peace in a church. Maybe, maybe it's the quiet. Maybe, maybe it's the good that people find in there. Now, whatever it was, it made a man feel glad about pretty much everything. I haven't been in a church since I don't know when. Oh, is that so? I uh, heaved to my... Well, she's becalmed again, mister. <laughs> okay. Uh, this. Uh, uh, she sure wasn't built for it, I'll tell you. You ever see anything like that? <laughs> uh, she is kind of old, isn't oh, she? I've had her going on eight years. She hasn't changed a mite. Eats like a pig and looks like a four-legged mizzenmist. <laughs> Smoke? Don't mind. Hey... What about that, uh, that fellow Hightower? Did you get that bottle to him? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, I, I guess it was lonely over in the depot all alone. He, he was glad for the company. There was a wood fire burning in the stove, but it didn't keep out the cold. Merry Christmas. Well, how's it going, Mr. Hightower? Oh, slow, Marshal, slow. Bit of excitement about an hour back, though. That so? Yeah, 9.15 got stuck between here and Hutchison. Lots of snow back there. They getting her out? Sure, they're trying, but (laughs) I'm sure glad I'm not on it. It's going to be a cold night on that train. Well, it's kind of chilly in here, isn't it, Mr. Hightower? Any warmer, and I'm going to sleep. Well, say, we brought you over a bottle of Irish for company. (laughs) Jameson's well. I declare I was just thinking about a tot before you boys come in. Now, that's (laughs) real friendly. Will you have a drink with me? We sure will. Let's open her up, huh? A couple of glasses up on the shelf there, Chester. Get them down, will you? I don't know if you get an idea about the folks in Dodge or not. They, they're not any different than any other people. Or the town either. Uh, I guess maybe it's a pretty small place at that. The depot, the hall, a few stores, a church, Doc's office, a Texas trail, Alifaganza, my office. Uh, well, not much, but... Hey, it's where you live, you know? Sounds all right. I lived in a town once back east. Small. I know what you mean. Well, maybe you'll be going back. Maybe. Say, the kids, they still believe in St. Nick. Oh, sure. I I mighty suppose. few kids down where I've been. Injun kids, they don't believe in St. Nick. No reason they should, I guess. I used to believe in it, you know that? Well, I guess most people did one time or another. Hey, you figure we come maybe ten miles? Maybe. Yeah, it's getting dark. Yeah. Well, come on. You want to... You want to ride the saddle for a bit? Oh, no, no. I, uh, that's okay. Well, then, okay. We rode on, and I thought about last year, about Kitty... Doc and Chester and me 
going over to Doc's place after Doc caught tired at Tendon Bar at the Texas Trail. It was about a quarter to midnight, and we stood around and sang Christmas carols. And I, I remember how it sounded that night, how it looked. The glow in the stove in the middle of the room and uh, the frosty windows. <laughs> yeah, it was Christmas Eve, all right. It was so deep, nowhere. What do you say if we... Hey, hey, uh, listen. Hey. Huh? Huh? Oh. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> you know, I feel sentimental. That's exactly what I feel. I feel sentimental. I know what you mean, Doc. I surely know. Okay, Doc. Bring him out. <laughs> And I remember how Doc scuttled over to the bureau and brought out some packages. The presents weren't much, but it didn't matter what they were. And when we'd finished opening them, it was Chester who said what we were all thinking. I just... I, I, I just want to say... Miss Kitty, Doc, you, Mr. Dillon... I just want to say that this is the best doggone Christmas I ever had. And, and that's what I want to say. Say, you was going to tell me about that, uh, that fellow John was caught in that woman. What was her name? Oh, oh yeah. Ms. McNish. That's right. Well... She said yes, and you've never seen two happier people in your whole life. Yeah, she's Ms. McNish Bumpy now. Oh, that's good. <laughs> uh, you know, you might settle for a bit and dodge or you could get work there. Sure would be fine if you could get back tonight, wouldn't it? Well, it, it can't be helped. I'd be a lot further away and a sight more tired if you hadn't come along. <laughs> Now, listen, how far do you figure before there's a place you might pick up a horse? Oh, I don't know, 15 miles or so, maybe. Oh, I'm not going to make any 15 miles in this nag tonight, that's for sure. Oh, that's all right. Now, I tell you what, you go on alone, you see. Oh, no, forget now, it. Now, you go I... on alone. She'd hold out with one man on her. And then you get a fresh horse and you ride into Dodge tonight. Well, thanks, that's now, very I'm kind. telling you, I want you to go. I'll be fine, I've walked before. Probably make it almost as quick as you... Look, it's, it's real nice of you, Mr. Cowley, but no thanks. Uh, now, Christmas don't mean nothing to me. you got friends waiting for well, you. Well, I'll see them tomorrow. Ah, uh, you're a fool. Well, that may be. All of them nice folks, I'm going to make them feel pretty bad. Uh, look, I'll stay. If you want to go on along, uh, uh, thanks for the ride. Well... Might as well make camp, then. <laughs> I guess so. And listen, you want to tell me some more about uh, what you was telling me before we turn in? Well, sure. I but... take it kindly, mister. I'll get yourself settled. I got some stuff in my pack we can eat and maybe get a fire going. Then after we eat, you can tell me some more. We made a fire and then shared what we had for supper. He seemed to soften up after that, and we talked for a couple or three hours. It was like he was starved for news of people, everyday things, and just plain company. And that's how we spent Christmas Eve together out on the plane. And then when the fire was dying down and I was about ready for sleep, he said, Marshal, 
Yeah? I want to tell you something. I've been needing to tell it for a long time. Do you mind? Why, of course I don't mind. Well, then I'll tell you. A few years ago, I was skipper of a little schooner. I used to sail up and down the East Coast, you know, Boston, New York. Yeah. Well, one night, we hit dirty weather off New Jersey, real dirty. Blew us off course, and we piled up on the rocks and knocked the bottom out. That's too bad. There was 18 passengers aboard, Marshal. Four of them was kids. We never saw them again. No. And my own... My own wife and my kid went down, too. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Well, now, something must have happened to me after that. I didn't want nothing to do with, with ships or the sea, and I started to drift out this way. I couldn't forget, though, do you know? And I didn't want to be near folks, especially kids, to remind me, do you know? Yeah. Well, that's how come I've been slewing around ever since. Sure, I understand. Just kind of wanted to get it off my chest. Sure. Marshal, I'd like to ride into Dodge with you tomorrow. You think I might meet some of them folks you was telling about? Why? Oh, I don't see why not. That it'd be all right. Maybe I wouldn't need to drift no more. Maybe I could... Uh, Drop anchor, do you know? Yeah, you might at that. Yes. Well, good night. Good night. Merry Christmas, Marshal. Merry Christmas, Mr. Cowley. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Anthony Ellis, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Lawrence Dobkin, with Harry Bartell and John Daner, Parley Bear as Chester, Howard McNear as Doc, and Georgia Ellis as Kitty. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Tomorrow night, Edgar Bergen's real-life daughter Candy pays him and you a visit on The Edgar Bergen Show with Charlie McCarthy. Candy and Charlie hit it off fine, but Edgar has cause to regret his hasty decision to invite his six-year-old daughter into the show, especially when she starts throwing her voice. Sounds like fun tomorrow night on most of these same stations when CBS Radio presents The Edgar Bergen Show with Charlie McCarthy. This is Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, Eve Arden is our Miss Brooks, teaches you how to laugh every Sunday on the CBS Radio Network.
Dodge City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the spell of gun smoke. <laughs> Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. It was over a hundred miles back to Dodge, but I figured I could make it easy in a day and a half. I'd been in Hayes City as a government witness in a murder trial, and I was anxious to get back. So I rode out of Hayes one morning a couple of hours before light. The ground was clear as snow, but it was midwinter, and it was sharp cold. When the day came, there was no sun, only dark gray sky drilled by a high, cold, searching wind. The air was as thin as I could ever remember it being. And behind me in the north lay a great slab of blackness. When I saw that, I should have turned back, for the wind stood out of the north, too, and sooner or later it would drive that black slab right down on top of me. This was blizzard weather, the kind of weather that kills the land and everything on it. I don't know why I went on, maybe because of the wind. You know, a high wind will distemper a man. Make him drunk-like. Anyway, I didn't turn back. And about noon, the sky began to turn white with snow, and I could smell a touch of moisture in the air. And finally it came. The sleet, shrilling in on the wind like small buckshot as the blizzard howled down the prairie. I couldn't look right or left without being stung blind, but as long as I kept the wind on my back, I knew I was headed south. Two hours of this, and I could feel my horse slowing down and weakening under me. My own body stiffened with the cold. Men died when they got caught in a thing like this. They died easy. Another hour passed, and my horse was carrying his head close to the ground. I figured he'd stumble soon, so I kicked my feet out of the stirrups and braced myself against the horn. By now, the wind had really gotten into me. And when I saw the blur of a ranch house up ahead, I thought maybe it was a trick. But a few minutes later, we rounded a corner of the place and stood at last in the lee of the storm. I slid down and got up to the door and pounded on it. And I waited. Then I pounded again. Then the door came open and the figure stood in the light. Who are you? Bring him in, L.B. Any man out in that weather's been made harmless. Get inside. Out of the way, L.B., you fool. All right, stranger, hands in the air. Hi. That's better. Unload him, L.B. Nice gun, Hack. Real nice gun. Shut up. Take him down, stranger. You can come up to the stove now, but don't try nothing. I'll cut you in half with buckshot. He was a burly man with flushed cheeks and a wild red beard and a great shock of red hair. Even his hands and fingers bristled with it. He sat on a stool by the stove, a shotgun across his knees. And his eyes never left me. The other one, Alvy, had a body of an underfed boy, but he was completely bald, and his skin was tight and dry. He looked like a naked skull, and his eyes, well, something had touched Alvy. You look half froze, stranger. You must have wanted something real bad to go out in weather like this. I never saw him around here before, Hack. He's a stranger, Alvy. He don't belong around here. 
course, we don't know anybody, but I, I, I seen a few, and I never seen him before. Maybe he's seen you, Alvy, somewhere. Not me. He, he never saw me nowhere. How do you know that? Maybe he was just looking for some cows and got lost in the storm. You're just a kid, Alvy. I always said you don't know much. Bell! Bell, get on out here. She was a pretty girl, but with a dark, half-wild look that I'd never seen before in a woman. Her eyes jumped from man to man and then came to rest on me, fixed and curious. And then after a moment, she looked away and moved it into a chair across the room. Supper ready, Belle? It's awful cold out. You recognize him, Belle? You ever see him before? No. Nope. You're sure now. Maybe Hayes City... Maybe you saw him up there sometime. I don't know him. You sure? Yes. If you're lying to me, you know what I'll do to I you. I never saw him before. He come in here half froze, right right out of the blizzard. Must have been looking for some cows and got lost. Shut up, Alby. We don't know what he's doing here, Bell. Why shouldn't a man get out of the storm? Even in here. That's enough. All right, stranger, we never saw you before. We don't know who you are. And as soon as I think you're lying, I'm going to blow a big hole in you. What about my horse? I'd like to put him in the barn if you've got one. Alvy? Oh, now, Hack, I ain't going out there. I'd freeze. And the horse will freeze if you don't. It's his horse. We might need it. Go on, Alvy, before I get cross. All right, I'll go. I know why the horse is so important. Elvie's a good boy. He'll put your horse up. Thank you. Supper's about ready. Leave it. I want to talk to our friend here first. Maybe we won't have to feed him. Potatoes will get mealy. They better not, that's all. I'm right curious about you, mister. I've noticed that. I'll blow your guts all over the wall, you make fun of me. Don't get me mad, mister. I got the shotgun. The meat will be boiled to shreds if we don't eat soon. You just won't understand any other way, will you, Bell? What is it you want to know about me? <laughs> I can tell, mister, I can handle you easy now. What do you mean? All I got to do is wallop the girl and you'll talk. I don't have to do nothing to you. All right, if I take my jacket off, I've warmed up now. I mind. You might have a gun hit out in there. He can raise his hands. I'll unbutton it. Well, now, that's right smart of you, Bell. Oh, I'll hide it. No, leave it be. Bell, come over here, Bell. Drop the jacket, Bill. Now hold out your other hand. Now open it, Bill. Open your hand. That's real bad what you did, Bill. Real bad. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put you outside for a spell out in the weather. After supper, after you've cleaned up supper, you can be thinking about it till then. United States Marshal. You're in bad company, Marshal. You shouldn't have come here. Oh? Huh? Well, looks to me like I sort of struck gold coming here. Now, why do you talk like that, Marshal? I still got the shot. Let me get that stove. Seems like it's getting colder and colder. You didn't see any sign of nobody outside, did you, Alvy? What? Ooh. Somebody might have come along to cover the marshal here, it's all. Marshal? What, what, what marshal? Me. I'm a marshal, Alvin. Shoot him, Hack. Shoot him. Shut up and answer me. Was there sign of another horse footprints, anything like that? Ah, oh, I didn't see nothing. Maybe you didn't look. Would I have walked in here the way I did if I'd been after you people? Maybe your head got muddled with the cold. Where'd you ride from, Marshal? Hayes City. Left there this morning. <laughs> 
It was a fool thing to do with a blizzard coming up. Maybe. Or did you think you could get the jump on us easier in a storm? Was that it, Marshal? Yeah. You knew we'd be trying to keep cozy in here. I'm curious, Hack. What are you and Alvy on the run for? Don't you tell him, Hack. I don't trust him at all. <laughs> Alvy, it'd be mighty dull without you, boy. <laughs> don't laugh at me, Hack. Now stop it. I don't like laughing. You know that, Hack. And don't you do it no more. I got ways. Yeah, I ain't seen you in your ways. But don't try them on me, Alvy. Maybe I won't. Look, Alvy, now you don't understand. It's all right to tell the marshal about us. He ain't going nowhere. No? No, of course not. We'll kill him, Alvy. We'll kill him and bury him somewhere. Oh, uh, sure. Now, now, why didn't I think of that? Because I do the thinking for us, Alvy. That's why. Now, uh, what was it you like to know, Marshal? Stop playing games, Hack. Me and Alvy are wanted for murder. Up in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Seems a mite unfair, though. We didn't aim to kill nobody. It just happened that way. We was robbing a bank. Yeah, and a couple of the people there wouldn't do what we told them, so Alvy used his knife on one, but it just made the man holler. You could hear him all over town. And we had to shoot our way out after that. Must have killed three or four people. I know I killed two. Worst of it was, Marshal, all we wanted just then was some money. We didn't care about killing anybody. But you know how it is, Marshal, when you're robbing a bank and all. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> now, I don't suppose you do it that. Anyway, we're wanted for murder, and we didn't even get any money. Nary a dollar. So we rode out here and lighted for a spell. I see. What about Bell? And whose place is this, anyway? It's my place, now that Pa's gone. You mean you were living here alone? No. They killed your Pa, is that it? Yes. How long ago? I don't know. Maybe a month. Yeah, it's been about a month, hasn't it, Alvy? Thirty-five days. There, you see? Alvy always knows just how long everything's been. No, that's fine. Tell me what you do with him. Who? The old man. Oh, we, we buried him out back. <laughs> we couldn't afford a funeral. <laughs> Could we, Alvy? Hack, 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 we told him that. Now let's shoot him. No, no, I've been thinking it over. People in Hayes City know he started for Dodge, and when he don't show up, they might come looking for him. But you, you said we'd bury him, Hack. That's what you said. Yeah, that's right, but we can't bury his horse, too. Not in this ground. It's froze solid. And if we turn the horse loose and they find it and can't find the marshal's body, then they'll suspect something. You're pretty smart, Hack. Too bad you don't know enough to stop killing people. Too bad for you, anyway. Well, what are we going to do, Hack? I, I'm getting hungry. That supper won't be fit to eat. Shut you? up! One more word out of you, Bella, and I'll whoop you good. Come on, Hack. I'm really hungry. No, no, li listen to me, Elvie. Now, my idea is to knock the marshal on the head and throw him outside to freeze. Now, he'll keep real good that way. And when the storm breaks, we can carry him off 20 miles or so and dump him on the ground. Look like he got throwed and hit his head and froze. Oh, that's fine, Hack. That's just fine. Then we'll break his horse's leg, make it easier for them to find him. You just don't care about anything, do you, Hack? Just me. Sometimes, Alvy. Sure. Me and Hack are friends, ain't we, Hack? Of course, if it don't want snowing, we'll have to think of something else. Can't leave tracks for them to follow back there. Oh, Hack, ain't we gonna kill him now? Well, sure, sure we are, Alvy. I didn't mean that. Let me hit him, huh? Y you keep the gun on him, and I'll get up behind and hit him. Th there was a Brandon iron around here somewhere. I'll, I'll hit him with that. Hack, you sunk pretty far, but I'm sort of wondering just how far. What do you mean? I'm wondering if you're low enough to... Kill a man before he's been fed. Here, here it is, Hack. Here, see? I found it. Leave it be, Alvy. We're going to eat first. We 
We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, this Sunday night, Lionel Barrymore is your host and Joseph Cotton the star on Sunday Night Playhouse's gripping historic drama based on the life of Peter Marshall. Hear how a Scottish immigrant lad rose to the position of chaplain of the United States Senate. A story you'll agree is far more fascinating than fiction. Remember, it's tomorrow night when Lionel Barrymore introduces another Sunday Night Playhouse on most of these same CBS radio stations. Now for the second act of Gunsmoke. It was only five in the afternoon, but the blizzard had darkened the land and its blackness showed in at the windows. Here and there along the walls of the ranch house, tricklets of snow blew in through the warped timber. In the kitchen, Hank sat directly behind me while I ate. Later changed places with Alvy and fed himself heartily, as though he had nothing at all on his mind. Hank was just a nerveless brute, born with no conscience at all. His intelligence was the instinct of an animal that snapped at or killed whatever got in its way of survival. Every living thing was his enemy. And Alvy? Well, there was no way to figure Alvy. Too much of him was missing. My only chance lay in the girl, Belle. Even though Hack had pretty well beaten all resistance out of her. Supper was over soon enough, but Hack seemed in no particular hurry to get on with his plans. I've eaten better food on the trail than that. Can't blame me for it. Now get it cleaned up, Belle. You can talk your head off when you're outside alone, and you're going outside. I'll learn you to heal if I have to break your neck. Now, don't do that, Hack. Not till we're ready to pull out, anyway. Why? Well, I ain't going to do the cooking. Well, I hope not. I've eaten your cooking. My sister was a good cook. Yeah, we should have brought her along, Alvy. No, no. I don't like her. Where are you from, anyway? Which, me or Alvy? Well, you to start with. Wyoming, place called Crowhart. I didn't stay there long, though. What about you, Alvy? Now, where were you born, Alvy? I never did know. Republican River. <laughs> That's not a place, you fool. Well, that's what they told me. Republican River. They always lived in a wagon, my ma and pa. Had a lot of kids, too. Of course, most of them died. I'm about the only one that made out any good at all. And you did fine, I'll be fine. Uh, give me the shotgun. All right, Marshal, let's get back by the stove while Bell cleans this mess up. Shall we hit him and... Throw him out to freeze up now, Hack? Not yet. I want to punish Bell first. You know, someday you're going to get caught without that shotgun, Hack. Somebody's going to tear you apart. That's fair enough, Marshal. Give me a fair chance at you then, huh? Barehanded? No. Oh, you're bigger than I am, Hack. Might be fun for you. I don't know nothing about fun. I ain't going to kill you because it's fun. Oh, come on, Hack. I want to go to bed. Bell. Bell, come out here. Get outside like I told you. And don't open that door so wide you'll blow the lamp out. Bell had walked through the room and out the door without a glance at any of us. I figured she'd go down to the barn where she'd be all right for a little while anyway. But I knew I'd have to make a move soon. I sure wasn't going to sit there like a fall hog and let Alvy knock me in the head whenever he got ready. But it didn't take much more sense to try to jump Hack in that shotgun and let him blow me all over the place. It was a beggar's choice, and the more I thought about it, the matter I got. Uh, Hack, I'm sleepy. I'm going to hit him and go to bed. You can do what you want after, but I ain't staying up all night. 
Dovey's got his mind made up, Marshal, I can tell. Just what do you call his mind, Heck? I got ways to fix you, Marshal. Nah, never mind, Alvy. Wrap something around that iron, otherwise it won't look like he hit his head on a rock. What difference it makes? Do what I say, Alvy. All right, Hack. Here, I'll use this curtain. Now, keep your eyes on me, Marshal. Alvy moved around behind me and was getting a good grip on his brand and iron. I leaned slightly forward in the chair and was tensed and waiting for the split second when my instinct had told me to jump. And then suddenly the door was flung wide open and the wind roared in, almost lifting the room as it came. The lamp flared and then went out as I plunged sideways from the chair. Ah! Did you hit him, Alvy? Did you hit him? Ah, You bloody fool. Don't you try nothing, Marshal. I got some more shells right here. Don't you move now. I crawled across the room and was off the door before Hack could reload. In the snow outside, I stood up and turned to find Belle waiting by the side of the door, a pitchfork in her hand. I couldn't see her face very well in the dark, but I could tell she was shaken with cold. I reached out and took the fork from her and then flattened myself against the wall and waited. I was afraid it was you he shot. That was a smart trick, Belle, throwing the door open that way. He shot Alvy, didn't he? Yeah. Good. I think he's found out I'm not in there. What are you going to do? Wait. Marshal. Marshal. I'm going to kill you and the girl both now. I waited, praying he'd come through the door before my hands got too cold to hold the pitchfork. And finally, the barrel of the shotgun appeared waist high and began to poke its way around in our direction. It was stupid of him, but a man behind a gun often gets a false sense of power. I let him shove it out three or four inches, and then I slammed down on it. <laughs> then I jumped into the room. Hack tried to club me with a gun, but he missed. And I got in under him with a fork and lifted him off his feet. And he struggled for a moment like a spirit fish and then went limp. And I let him fall. One of the prongs had reached his heart. Did you get him, Marshal? Is he dead? Yeah. I light the lamp. I can't do it, Marshal. My fingers are too stiff. Here, I'll I'll do it. There. Uh, quite a mess in here. Why don't you wait in the kitchen, Bill? I'm all right, Marshal. But I can't help you much till I get warmed up some. Well, then you'll stay by the stove, huh? I'll lug these people outside. Thank you, Marshal. Marshal? Marshal Dillon? What? Oh. Morning, Belle. Come on out in the kitchen, Marshal. It's warm there, and I got some hot coffee waiting. Uh, that sounds good. Uh, I say, it looks like the storm's lifted. It has. The wind's gone, but it's mighty cold out. Well, I don't mind the cold. It's that wind that breaks a man down. There. Get some of that in you. Uh. <clears throat> oh, you make mighty good coffee, Bill. <laughs> Tell me something, Marshal. Hmm? Tell me the truth now. Oh, uh, sure, Bill. What is it? Are you married? I'd make a... Poor husband, Bell, for any woman. Why? Well, in my profession, it's it's too chancy. 
Thank you, Marshal. Thanks for putting it that way. Now, Bella, I, I didn't mean... Forget that. it. I'm leaving this place, Marshal. What? As soon as you go, I've packed what I need and I'm clearing off. Where will you go? i got three horses. I'll ride up to Hayes City and sell them. Then what? I'll buy some pretty clothes and... And I'll find a place. Won't be hard after this. I, uh... I wish I could help you, Bell. You have. Oh, but I mean... I can uh, take care of myself, Marshal. I just want to get away from here, that's all. Sure. Uh, I'll stop at the nearest ranch and tell the men to come over here and take care of Hack and Alvy as soon as it warms up. Whatever you like, Marshal. Well, goodbye, Belle. Goodbye, Marshal. Look me up in Hayes City next time you're there. Sure. Sure I will. But, uh, Belle, don't let all this make you bitter. There are a lot of good men in the world. So they say. So long, Marshal. I, uh... So long, Bill. A few minutes later, I'd saddled up and was on the trail to Dodge. The sky was low and a slate gray all over, but there was no wind. The blizzard had gone, leaving the land still and white and bitter cold. There wasn't a sign of life anywhere. It was like riding through a vast tomb. And I found myself feeling like a trespasser. As though something had gone wrong. And I wasn't supposed to be there at all. Smoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner as Hack, Harry Bartell as Alvey, and Vivi Janice as Bell. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Starts this Monday, a new run for Road of Life, returning to CBS Radio to join the rest of your daytime listening favorites at the Star's Address. Road of Life, telling the day-to-day -day story of surgeon scientist Dr. Jim Brent. We'll keep your interest at a high point every Monday through Friday on most of these same stations. Remember, starting this coming Monday, Road of Life in its 16th year will be heard again on CBS Radio. Roy Rowan speaking. America now listens to 105 million radio sets and listens most to the CBS Radio Network.
Dodge City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the spell of gun smoke. <laughs> Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. p.m. We got in right on time, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, the railroad's getting better every month, Chester. Looks like they're going to civilize this prairie yet. Well, I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> All right, let's go. Well, Abilene sure don't change much. Looks about like it did the last time I was here. Yeah, we're getting most of the cattle at Dodge now. Boom's leveled off here. It's still a rough town, though, I suppose. You think he'll put up a fight? I don't know, Chester. He's pretty mean from all reports. He may. We'll try to avoid it, though. Of course, we're only guessing anyway. He he might not even be here. He always heads to Abilene when he gets in trouble. It's his hometown. He'll be here. Mm. One good thing, it's Bill Hickok's town, too. At least we'll have the local sheriff on our side for once. Yeah. I suppose that's some help. Some help? (laughs) Well, I'd rather have Wild Bill along than anybody I know. I suppose. Chester, what's the matter with you? You're acting like a man at his own funeral. Uh, Mr. Dillon, I've had an uneasy feeling ever since we left Dodge. A kind of a hunch, you might say. Ah, oh, it's nonsense. They're going to pick up a killer and take him back for trial. That's all. Maybe. And maybe not. Look, Chester, any man who lives by a gun knows down inside that he's going to die by one someday. But if he's got any sense, he keeps from thinking about it. Of course, he can't help getting a hunch now and then. I had plenty of them myself. Mostly wrong. Come on, Chester, let's walk down to the last chance and I'll buy you a drink. As a matter of fact, I'll buy us both a drink. Quite a crowd in here for this time of day. Yeah. I've been looking around for a while, Bill, but I don't see him. Suppose the Daggett kid might be in here, Mr. Dillon? Well, he spent most of his time hanging around the saloons while he was in Dodge. Here you are, boys. Drink up. Thank Thank you. you. Oh, uh, by the way, bartender, do you happen to know a kid around town by the name of... uh... Who, mister? What? Oh, oh, never mind, never mind. Well, he's here, Chester. Hmm? Down there at the end of the bar. Yeah, it's him, all right. Well, Sir Mr. Dillon? He's what we're here for. We gonna wait for Mr. Hickok? No. Come up on his left side, Chester, and watch his gun head. Oh, yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Dillon. I'm telling you, it was the funniest sight you ever seen. Yeah. Bullet knocked that scrawny iron dog end over end. <laughs> First shot I fired. Caught him right in the back of the... Uh, You're Jack Daggett, aren't you? That's right, mister. What about it? My name's Dillon, U.S. Marshal from Dodge. You're under arrest. You're kind of out of your territory, aren't you? 
Marshal's territory's anywhere. I'll take that gun of yours now. You will, huh? All right. Drop it. Drop the gun. Let go of my wrist. Drop the gun. Drop nothing. You heard the marshal. Oh! Uh, that was easy, Mr. Dillon. A lot easier than what I thought it'd be. All right, Chester, put the cuffs on it. Yes. Seems to me your partner acted a little high-handed there, Marshal. It does, huh? Now, he had no call to slug that boy in the head that way. Would you rather have put a bullet in his belly? Chester saved his life. That's all he was drawing on me. Well, now, if you'd come around and seen me before you started anything, you wouldn't have had this trouble. My name is Rourke. I'm the town constable here. I see. Young Jack here told me all about that shooting out in Dodge. Said they ganged up on him in a poker game, tried to cheat him. Forced him to shoot his way out. That's a good story. It's too bad it didn't happen that way. All right, Chester, let's get him on his feet and go find the sheriff. I, uh, reckon you won't be finding him, Marshal. Why not? Hickok's up in Topeka. Won't be back for a week or ten days. Meantime, I'm the law in Abilene. And I got a favor to ask from you. I'd like to use one of your jail cells until 9 o'clock. That's when the next train leaves for Dodge. Mm. Well, I'm sorry, Marshal. I got no authority to do anything like that. What difference does that make? If Wild Bill were here, he'd let me do it. But Wild Bill ain't here. I see. A lot of us folks here like to run our own town. We don't like outsiders coming in and taking over. It's four hours till that train leaves, Marshal. I think you're going to find four hours in a long time. Meaning? This uh, young fellow you arrested has got a couple of older brothers. The Daggett boys. You probably never heard of them, but you're going to. They're not going to like this. I don't care much what they like. Maybe they'll teach you to care when they hear about this. And they'll hear. Like I said, four hours is a long time. Look, I want you to get this straight. I came here to arrest the killer and take him back to Dodge to stand trial. I got him under arrest now, and I'm going to take him back. Maybe. All right, Chester, let's get him out of here. Get hold of his other arm there. Lift him up. Yes, sir. Take him out if you want. Mr. Dillon? What is it, Chester? Maybe it was too easy. Yes, gentlemen. What can I do for you? We'd like to get a room, please. Well, I have a very nice one right at the head of the stairs. If you'd care to look at it... That won't be necessary. We'll only need it for about four hours until the train leaves for Dodge. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, if you'll just sign the register here. Thank you. My, your friend seems to have suffered quite an injury. Yes, sir. He bumped his head. Oh, really? Well, it's certainly a bad cut just to have had... Boy, that... That's one of the Daggett boys. Young Jack Daggett. Yeah. yeah, that's right. I got him under arrest for murder. Now, where's the room? You arrested Jack Daggett? Right here in Abilene? Yeah. You say the room was up... And, and you're planning to keep him here at my hotel for the next four hours? Well, I can't stand out there on the street with him. Oh, Marshal. Marshal, do you know what's going to happen when the Daggett boys hear about this? No, but I understand they may not like it very much. May not like it. I'm sorry, sir, but you cannot stay here. I will not let my hotel be made the scene of a bloody massacre. Now, just a minute, mister. Yeah, You've I, rented me a room. I've I, signed the register, and I've got the key. I, I, and I'm going to use that I... room until 9 o'clock, whether you like it or not. It's the second door at the top of the stairs. Thank you. Come on, Daggett. Move. You heard him, son. Come on. Keep your hands off. There's just one thing, sir. Yeah. 
It's, it's not a question of your honesty, you understand, but in view of the circumstances, I wonder if you'd mind uh, paying in advance. <laughs> What time is it, Chester? It's... It's 6.23, Mr. Dillon. Mm, I thought it was later than that. Yes, sir, I know. He goes pretty slow when you're waiting for something. Like this. I swear I wished it was 9 o'clock. I, I wished we were leaving on that train right now. You're not leaving on no train. Not alive. You've got a one-track mind, Daggett. So have my brothers, Dylan. What they think about all the time is hands off the Daggetts. That goes for you or anybody else. Reckon we ought to stuff a pillow in his mouth, Mr. Dillon? <laughs> Might not be a bad idea. You won't think it's funny when they come around. But maybe they won't come around. Maybe they decided... Cover the door from the other side, Chester. Yes, sir. Yeah, who is it? It's me, sir. The clerk. What do you want? It's the Daggett boys. They're across the street at the last chance right now. And you're hoping I'll go over there instead of waiting for them to come here, huh? Well, I... I... All right. I'd rather jump them than have it the other way around. Chester, I guess we'll go over and have a talk with him. What about him? No, well, he's cuffed hand and foot to a pretty solid iron bed. I don't think he's going anywhere. I'll bet on it. You ready, Chester? I'm ready whenever you are, Mr. Dillon. All right, let's go. <laughs> Return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, this Monday night and most of these same stations, be sure to be with us when Lux Radio Theater raises the curtain on its full hour adaptation of the exciting screenplay Phone Call from a Stranger. Shelley Winters and Gary Merrill recreate their original screen roles in this dramatic thriller about the experiences of a lone survivor of an airplane crash and bringing the tragic news to families of the victims. Remember, it's on Lux Radio Theater this Monday night on CBS Radio. Now for the second act of Gunsmoke. That must be them, Mr. Dillon. Across the room there. Yeah, I guess so. And they look a lot like Jack. And they look mad. And there's quite a crowd around them. Well, Chester, the only way to get it over is to get it started. Yes, sir. Uh, how will we do it, Mr. Dillon? I haven't got a plan, Chester. Face them down, that's all. Yes, sir. You the Daggett brothers? What if we are? This is him, Jim. This is a fellow. Shut up, Rourke. You've been glad enough to stay out of this so far. Stay out of it now. My name's Dillon, United States Marshal from Dodge City. I got your brother Jack under arrest for murder. You probably heard about it. Yeah, rumors got around. I'm taking him out of here on the 9 o'clock train. He's going back to Dodge to stand trial. My guess is he's going to hang. Yeah. Now, the point is, what are you going to do about it? Why didn't you wait? We'd have looked you up. <laughs> you didn't answer my question. 
Still two hours and a half till nine o'clock. I reckon we've got plenty of time yet. We'll wait. Why wait? What's the matter with now? Would rather wait. Maybe you're trying to pick up some helpers among this bunch of hangers-on, huh? Well, look at them. Each one to trying to sneak behind the man next to him. If you're counting on any help there, you better forget it. You're pushing your luck, Dylan. I don't think so. You boys are full of talk, and that's all. You never even intended to start anything. You're a dirty liar. We're going to do Hold plenty. It. Now, don't you move, either one of you. You covering my back, Chester? Yes, sir. All right. I'll take that gun. Thank you. Yours, too. Sure. It's your play, Dylan. Where it stands now. Thank you. Here, Chester. Kick those back under the tables. Yes, sir. All right, folks, just leave them lay, please. Don't nobody touch them. Here, Chester. Now hold on to my gun. All right, Mr. Dillon. Now just keep them off my back. Yes, sir. You. Come here. Sure. You called me a liar, didn't you? Yeah. Why, you cheap chin horn, you oh, I can't do this. Come on, get it. 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 All right, you. You're next. I'll wait, Marshal. I'll get to you later. You're a no-good coward, Daggett. All right, Chester, I'll take my gun back now. Here you are, sir. Thank you. All right, boys, the show's over. Unless, of course, one of you'd like to take up where the Daggett's left off. Any one of you still figuring on helping them try to take my prisoner away from me? No? I didn't think so. You're all fine, upright citizens now, huh? A pride and joy to Constable Rourke here. That's enough, Dylan. I thought I told you boys the show was over. All right, get out. Go on, get out, all of you. Move! All right, let's get out of Marshal, I'd say you overreached yourself there. Step past the limits of your authority. How I enforce the law is my own business. I do things my own way. Mm -hmm. A way that'll get you killed someday. Maybe. I have to live in this town, Dylan. You don't know these Daggett brothers. If you cross them, you're through. I've seen it happen. Come on, Chester, let's go. All right, Mr. Dillon. What time is it, Chester? It's... It's 7.45, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, the time's dragging. Yes, sir. It's still an hour and 15 minutes till that train leaves. What difference does it make? You're not going to be on it. Neither one of you are. The way I'm figuring, Jack, we'll all three be on it. You wait and see. You'll never get to that train. My brothers will take care of you. They don't seem to be in any hurry about it. You wait. I sure do wish I hadn't had such an uneasy hunch about this trip. <laughs> Forget it, Chester. They'll stop you. You just wait. <laughs> Yeah. 
It's only 8.15. Mr. Dillon seems to be going slower all the time. Yeah, it's up, though. It won't be much longer now. 45 minutes. If the train's on time. And if we're lucky enough to get on it. Chester, you're wearing yourself out. Why don't you sit down and relax, huh? I just can't seem to set my mind to it, Mr. Dillon. No daggett will ever leave this town wearing handcuffs as long as the other two are alive. Well, I'd think that's up to them, Jack. Sure. And they'll take care of it, too. I, I swear and declare, Mr. Dillon, I almost wish they would try something and get it over with. <laughs> the waiting's always the worst part, Chester. You find out what the worst part is. I could slug him, Mr. Dillon. No, let him talk. Let him talk, Chester. He's only got a few more weeks to do it in. They'll never hang me. I'll never even stand trial. You wait and see. Chester? It's half past eight exactly, Mr. Dillon. All right. Let's get started. A little early, isn't it? Won't take that long to walk from here to the station. It might if we have trouble. Mm. Yes, sir, I guess it might. You'll have trouble. Don't you worry about that. Jack, why don't you get on a new subject? How are we going to take him, Mr. Dillon? Just drag him? If he wants it that way. Otherwise, he'll walk handcuffed to my left wrist. Keep him covered, Chester. I'll unlock these cuffs and get him loose from the bed. Yes, sir. Dillon, if you're smart, you leave me here and run while you still got the chance. Well, I've never been smart enough to run yet. Stick out your right wrist. All right. On your feet. Come on. You can put your gun away, Chester. Starting now, he's only going where I go. Now, come on, Jack. We got a train to catch. Thank heaven, gentlemen, you're leaving. Yeah, we're leaving. And I want to thank you for your wonderful hospitality. I'll be glad to recommend your hotel to anybody who plans to stop over in Abilene. Oh, I, I hardly know what to say, Marshal. You simply don't understand. You don't know these Daggett brothers. No, no, no offense personally, Jack. I have to live in this town, and I... Come on, Jack. Yeah, uh, I... Now, you boys must run quite a bluff. You got everybody in town jumping sideways. You'd be smart if you did, Dylan. Good luck, gentlemen. Best of luck to, to all of you. <laughs> all of us. Well, that's hedging his bet. Look there, Mr. Dillon. Not a soul on the street. Quiet as a graveyard. Yeah. And they're going to make a play, Chester, somewhere between here and the depot. We can count on that. Yes, sir, I kind of figured they would. Especially after getting beat up over there at the saloon. Oh, they would have anyway. And jumping them like that did one good thing. It scared the pack off. At least we only have to worry about the daggets, not a mob. You'll think it's a mob shut by up. the time... Now, from here on, you keep your mouth shut. If you don't so help me, I'll slug you and drag you to the depot. All right, now, let's go. Now, sir, not a soul. I never thought I'd see the main street of Abilene deserted at this time of night. It's not deserted, Chester. They're inside, behind the shutters. But at least they're staying out of it. I wonder if coyotes are as lonesome as they sound, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> they couldn't be, Chester. Watch that left side up ahead of us, sir. It's pretty dark along there. Yes, sir. They might jump us from behind. I don't think so. Too many people watching. They gotta keep up their reputation. I hope you're right. Chester, mm -hmm. there at the corner of the bank, somebody's moved. Across the street, too. 
in the shed. Take the one in the shot at Chester. Yes, sir. There's one down, Chester. The other one's still there in the shadows. Get him if you can. Jack, here's ruining my aim. I'll ruin more. Hey. All right. Jack. Good for you, Mr. Dillon. You ought to slugged him sooner. I didn't slug him, Chester. He caught a bullet that was meant for me. Well, shot by one of his own brothers. Here, let me unlock those handcuffs, Mr. Dillon. No, get... no time. Here, I'll get him up on my shoulder and... All right, let's move in and keep firing. Yes, sir. Hold it, Chester. Well, I guess we got the other one. Here, let me get him off my shoulder. Get these handcuffs off. Well, there's our prisoner, Jack Daggett. Wanted for murder, killed by his own brother. Let's take a look at the others. Mm -hmm. uh, three men dead. Look down the street there, Mr. Dillon. They're all starting to crawl out of their holes. Sure. They're all on our side now. Oh, come on, Chester. The train's coming. we got to get on it and get out of here. Yes, sir. Let Rourke clean up this mess. He ought to be good for something. Hmm. That sounds more lonesome than the coyotes. Gives a man the creeps. Yes, sir, it sure does. Well, you were wrong about that hunch of yours, Chester. It wasn't us. Not this time. Smoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Les Crutchfield, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Sam Edwards and Barney Phillips, with John Daner, Tom Tully, Larry Dobkin, and Jim Nusser. Harley Bear is Chester. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Tomorrow night, Lionel Barrymore and your Hallmark Playhouse invite you to enjoy another Hollywood cast bringing you another drama in the tradition of this fine program. Every week, your Hallmark Playhouse features Lionel Barrymore as host, Frequently, Mr. Barrymore stars as well. Historic dramas, stories about the human side of patriots, presidents, pioneers, and adaptations from literature. Enjoy them on Hallmark Playhouse over most of these same stations, presented by CBS Radio. This is Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, for thrilling dramas of Escape, listen Sunday nights to the CBS Radio Network. Just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with the U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke.
Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Over inside of Dodge anyway, Chester. There's Ellen Henry's homestead. Wonder how she'd take to serving up a breakfast, Mr. Dillon. I'm plum hungry. I'll settle for water and the horses. I don't imagine Ellen has any extra food. No, sir. It's gone pretty hard for her since Ethan died, hasn't it? That's the talk. Look at her place. Three lean-tos and not a green thing growing. I don't know how she makes out. Well, maybe Luther helps more than the folks give him credit for. For a son, he's not much good to my way of thinking. I don't know when he turns a hand for his mother between stops at the Texas Trail and the Long Branch. At least not much like his father was. Or Ellen either, for that matter. That's a mite early. Nobody's stirring. Oh, well. oh, oh. We better just water our horses and ride on, Chester. Yes, sir. Quiet like, isn't it? Hey, where'd you come from, Mr. Dillon? Uh, from the house, I think. Luther? I don't know. You're trespassing. Get off my land. It's Marshal Dillon, Ellen. We just stopped to water our horses. I recognize you. The trespassing still goes, Marshal. You're awful quick to fire, Ellen. Ethan and me never took to folks arriving unannounced. I still don't take to it. Well, that's no cause to be firing on us that way, Miss Henry, especially since you recognized it. Quit whimpering. If I'd aim to hit you, I'd have hit you. All right, Ellen. Get off my land and stay off. Just don't you get in any trouble with that rifle, Ellen. I expect you'll hear about it if I do, Marshal. Now get. I don't always aim high. Come on, Chester. How old would you say she is, Mr. Dillon? Oh, uh, she can't be over 40, I guess. If that. She looks like an old woman. 60 or more. She's dried up. Dead inside. Remember when Ethan and her and the boy came out here, Mr. Dillon, right after the war? She's an awful pretty little thing. Mm-hmm. Luther was a little more than a baby then. No, well, Mr. Dillon, I was just thinking. Ethan was so proud of his homestead and his boy and Ellen. Now he's five years dead, the boy's gone bad, and his wife and his homestead, they've just dried up. It's kind of sad, ain't it? Yeah, it is. Well, come on, Chester, let's get on into Dutch. Huh? Oh. Mitch. Oh, Mitch. Well, what'll it be? Uh, set up a bottle of rye, will you? Yes, sir, Marshal Dillon. <laughs> Look, there's Luther over there at the table, alone. Yeah, I saw him. <clears throat> well, thanks, Mitch. Wait here, Chester. Yes, sir. Uh, Mitch, could I have a little sugar in here? Mind if I don't get to my feet, Marshal? I got the feeling if I tried to stand up straight, I'd fall over first thing I knew. Sit still, Luther. I just don't have a lot of choice about it, Marshal. I was out by your place this morning, Luther. I hadn't seen your mother in a long time. Wish I could say the same. A woman shouldn't have to run a homestead alone. 
Not when her son's big enough to be a real help. Is this a lecture, Marshal? A do-good talk? Put your own name on it, Luther. I can't make you feel what you don't feel. But in a way, you're responsible for your mother and what she does. I'm real lucky, Marshal. I can quit listening any time I don't want to hear something. Between the old lady and people like you, I quit listening an awful lot. Get it straight, Luther. I don't care what happens to you. I done something wrong? You accusing me of something unlawful, Marshal? No. But if you have any feeling left for your mother or what happens to her, you'll do something about her. Living out there alone so much, she's gone a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> she shot at you. <laughs> Is that all that's concerning you, Marshal? Half the time I do go home, she levels off at me. I got a ride in under fire. Or crawl in on my belly. She's crazy, like you said. I swear, she's crazy. Then you ought to bring her into town. And get a keeper for her. Maybe I would. If I cared what happened to her, I don't care. I don't care at all. Well, that's up to you, Luther. Now, that's just another one of them things I didn't hear you say, Marshal. Well, Luther's just plain drunk, isn't he, sir? That and just plain no good. Whatever you said drove him right out of here, Mr. Dillon. Mm-hmm. Well, we haven't been in the office since early yesterday, Chester. All right, sir. Only... Only what? Well, sir, Mitch has got a catalog in the back room, and he's not busy, and he says it's just full of things you can order straight from St. Louis. I thought I'd... Well... Uh, you got extra money, have you, Chester? Oh, no, sir. Well, that is not really extra money, Mr. Dillon. It's just that... Well, Mitch swears you can get underwear from this catalog that don't rub your skin raw, and I'd like to take a look at it. <laughs> All right, Chester, I'll wait. Yes, sir. Thank you. Oh, uh, Marshal. Uh, oh, hello, Cass. Now, what's on your mind? Talk I heard, Marshal. It's uh, private, like maybe we'd go to your office. We can do our talking here. <laughs> I thought you was always of a mind to get me inside there, Marshal, where you could turn the key on me. Maybe I will someday, Cass. Now, come on, speak up. Yeah, I heard talk at Luther Henry Road cattle off Carnes' place last night. I saw you talking with him just now. I wondered if you'd heard the same. I haven't heard a thing, Cass. Odd, you wouldn't know. I was out of Dodge last night, all night. Uh, I wonder if it's so. L Luther didn't give himself away when you talked just now. You're the one who's heard the talk, Cass. I got my rights. I can ask questions of you, Marshal. If a man's heard ain't safe, he's got a right to know. Are you worried for Carnes or for you? If Carnes' cattle can be rode off, mine can. No. I didn't know you had much of a herd. What a man has is his own business, Marshal. I'm asking about Luther and the other rider. They say there was two. If Luther's wrong with the law, I'll get him. Is there anything else on your mind? Thanks, Mitch, for letting me see the book. Not a thing, Marshal. But I don't much like your attitude. I can't see that worry in me too much, Cass. All right, Chester, let's go. Yes, sir. Mr. Dillon, I was watching him from the back there. He's a sniveling sort, that cast. Mm-hmm. Come to think of it, though, I don't know a single bad thing he's done. Know any good he's done? No, sir. Can't say that he do, Mr. Dillon. Well, how about you, Joe? Find out about your fancy underwear. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> All right, now we can tend to business, huh? Come on. <laughs> Hello, 
Hello, Marshal. I was waiting for you. Oh, good morning, Mr. Carnes. Howdy, Chester. Well, how do, Mr. Carnes? You got the key, Chuck. Yes, sir. Well, I don't see you in town much, Mr. Carnes. Only when I got business, Marshal. Yeah. Well, come on in, won't you? My, it's close in here. <laughs> We've been away a day and a night, Mr. Carnes. Sure gets close that way. I'll just open up the back. Won't you have a chair, Mr. Carnes? I don't have a long piece to say, Marshal. It don't take long to say some of my cattle were stolen last night. Ah, I heard. So soon? Yeah, Cass Stetter told me about it a few minutes ago. Hmm. Well, I don't know how Cass come by the information, but it's true. This is the second time it's happened in the last few weeks. You don't keep much cattle, do you? Hardly any. I suppose a hundred heads is the most I ever had at one time. Mm-hmm. But last night I lost five or six about the same time before. Cass was of the mind that uh, Luther Henry did it. I don't know, Marshal. One of my hands said Luther was out of my place the other day just looking around. I got no real reason to suspect him. Only thing I know is that whoever it was rides a horse that shot all the way around. You don't see a lot of that on the prairie. No, you don't. You think there was just one rider, Mr. Carnes? There was two from the tracks, but the boys and me lost them in the rain. I thought I'd tell you about it, Marshal. I can't afford to lose a little I got. No, I'll do what I can, Mr. Carnes. I... I kind of hope it isn't Luther. Not for him so much as Ellen. She's had enough trouble. Yeah. Well, Chester and I'll ride out to the Henry place and look around, Mr. Carnes. If uh, Luther's guilty, maybe some of Ellen's troubles will be over. Or maybe they'll just be beginning. Turn for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, in the 17th annual poll of Noted Daily, CBS Radio won 12 first places. The top poll award, Champion of Champions, went to The Jack Benny Show. Best comedian was Eve Arden on Our Miss Brooks. Best comedian, Jack Benny. Best master of ceremonies, Bing Crosby. Bing also won the nod as best popular male vocalist. Doris Day was rated best feminine pop vocalist. And so it went. In all 12 first places. Now for the second act of Gunsmoke. I swear, Mr. Dillon, I feel like I was riding right into the camp of the enemy, coming back to Ellen this way. <laughs> you think we should be flying a white flag as we ride up, Chester? You know, I'd feel a little safer to tell the honest truth. Uh, she's got no reason to fire on us. <laughs> but I'll agree, that's a pretty small comfort. Oh. Look yonder, Mr. Dillon. I think I saw her peering out. It's all right, Chester. Come on. <laughs> I don't see Luther's horse around. Maybe he isn't here. Well? Afternoon, Ellen. I uh, want to talk a bit about uh, Luther. I got work to do in the shed. I'm going there. You want to talk. Let me help, Ellen. I'll get it. Uh, he's got a loose shoe. I aim to fix it. Well, we could be a hand, Ellen. If, yes, uh... I'm proud to. I aim to fix it myself. All right. He wouldn't have shoes if I waited for a man to shoe him. Easy. Easy, Dal. Easy. Oh. 
You've come to talk, Marshal. Yeah, about Luther. Come on. Open. Huh. Two nails clean out. No wonder it's loose. Carnes lost some cattle last night. Two riders got off with five or six head. One of Carnes' hands thinks Luther was one of them. Is he around, Ellen? I told you before. He comes and goes, Luther does. Well, have you seen him since we were here this morning? Don't recall that I have, Marshal. I got other things to occupy my thought. Like trying to get together enough money to go back to my people. What to do with those nails? Here they are, man. Oh. I'd admire to help you, Miss Henry. I'll do it. That's a fine horse, Ellen, a real fine horse. Shot all the way around. Come on, boy. That was Ethan's way. This your horse or uh, Luther's? Mine. What? Well, that was Luther, Mr. Dillon, and he took your horse. Yeah. Do I make a run after him, sir? Not when he's wild, Chester. I don't want you shot or him either. I just want to talk to him. Well, he just comes and goes, huh, Ellen? Believe what you want, Marshal. I didn't know he was around. Like I said, I never know. Quit caring. Don't worry, Marshal. Luther will get his. He's had it coming to him for a long time. Well, I guess we ride back double, Chester. Yes, sir, we sure do. Luther sure cut out quick, Mr. Dillon. Maybe he did run those cattle off Carn's place last night. Maybe. He's running away from something. Wonder where he'll hide. Everybody around here knows your horse. Oh, he's made a lot of mistakes. He'll make more. Nothing says he's going to turn bright all of a sudden. You're not worried about your horse then, Mr. Dillon? I don't think so, Chester. What kind of a woman is that, Mr. Dillon? Ellen? Yes, sir. I don't know. I'm not much of a hand to understand women, Chester, any woman. I don't know. You think she knew Luther was home all along? Maybe. I just don't understand it, Mr. Dillon. It's not right somehow, a woman not caring about her own son. You hear her? She said right out, I quit caring. It just don't seem right. Still might close in here. I believe I'll leave them back windows up a spell, Mr. Dillon. I think I'll go up to Emil's blacksmith shop, Chester, and see if he has a horse to spare. All right, sir. Uh, there's some paperwork to catch up on if you get the time. Yes, sir. Of course, you'll want to write that place in Chicago about your underwear, the first thing. <laughs> yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> I'll be back, Chester. But... Well, I may not need that horse after all. How's that, Mr. Dillon? Ellen Henry's riding up the street, leading my horse. Well, bless my soul, it sure is. There's something thrown across her saddle. Mr. Dillon, it looks like... Wait here, Chester. Hello, Ellen. I brought your horse back, Marshal. He's been run hard. He looks all right. You, uh... You found Luther, did you? He's dead. You found him dead? He had it coming a long time. Here, I'll lift him down. (laughs) 
Chester! Easy. Easy, Daryl. Easy. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon? Uh, Chester, take the body up to docks, will you? Yes, sir. Miss Henry, I... I'm real sorry. I'll be going now, Marshal. Well, I'll take my horse then, Ellen. You, uh... You got any plans for... Barry and Luther? Put him in any ground you like, only... Don't tell me where it is or when you do it. You know how he died, Ellen? He was shot. Look, it's near dark, Ellen. You could put up in town for the night if uh, you'd... Don't put him near Ethan, Marshal. I wouldn't want that. Cut on! Doc's working on Luther now, Mr. Dillon. He's just plumb full of holes. Yeah, I know. Poor Miss Henry. Even though she don't act like it, I just know she feels terrible. Yeah, she's grieving her heart on. Where are you going, Mr. Dillon? I don't think I express my sympathy to poor Miss Henry. Proper. <laughs> I followed Ellen Henry West toward her homestead. The sun was down now, but I could see her ahead riding hard. There were clouds to the south and the smell of rain on the easy wind that blew in little circles around me. Ellen bore west, and I lost her past a clump of cottonwoods near Carnes Place, so I rode harder. When I came even with the trees, there was just enough sun ray left to see her head south toward the dark clouds. She wasn't going home. It was dark now. I couldn't see anything. The storm clouds stretched black from the south and fastened over half the sky. And I rode hard against them till I saw the flicker of lantern shine ahead. It was Cass Stetter's place. I left my horse out away from the house and walked in as softly as I could. Cass and Ellen were having their talk in a cattle shed near the you house. You trusted me before about the money, Ellen. What's the rush this time? My work's done, Cass. It was done last night when Luther and me drove them last few from Carnes place over here. I want my share and Luther's. Him not cold dead yet you want a share. Ain't a mother entitled to whatever her son leaves? Mother. You never had no mother feel for him, and him no love for you either. Ha! Huh. Ain't you the one to talk about love, though. It takes courage to love, to love with all of you. When the love goes, they take it and bury it in the ground. There's nothing left but hate. I wouldn't kill my own kin. You wouldn't be that honest. You won't even steal cattle yourself. Buy it off of them as has the courage to ride in and rustle. Yeah, well, how'd it feel killing your own Ellen? Like it'll feel killing you, Cass. If you don't give me the money here and now, like nothing at all. Luther's dead and gone because he tipped his hand, showed his face around Carnes' place, talked big in the saloons. He was no use. No use at all. There's no woman in you at all. I've been dead five years. And your time's running short, too, Cass. I'm in a hurry. Too late to hurry, Ellen. What's it? Too late to move for guns, so. Well, I'm sure glad to see you, Marshal. How are you, Cass? Oh, I sure am. I hey, guess I called a trick on Luther all right, didn't I? Yeah, you were a big help. You and Luther stole the cattle, Ellen, and brought them to Cass for pay, is that it? Only sometimes, like now, we didn't get paid. Don't believe her, Marshal. You wouldn't take the word of one as murders your own son, would you? I don't have to, Cass. Carnes' brand won't be hard to find on any cattle you got here. 
Cass was just slow to move him on, Marshal. If he'd have gone on toward Abilene with him last night like we planned... You're lying, Helen Henry. You're lying. Now get your horses. Both of you. Wait. Well, why are you taking me, Marshal? Well, there's some kind of a law, Cass, about buying and transporting stolen cattle. Yeah, Marshal knows his law, Cass. Did you... You know what she did to Luther, don't you, Marshal? Yeah, I know. Now, come on. You'd like it better, wouldn't you, Marshal? If one of us made a move so you could use your gun. I said, come on, Ellen. I think I'd like it better if you used your gun, Marshal. I ain't going to get back east now anyway. You'd be taking a coward's way out, Ellen, if you made me kill you. Ah. <coughs> I said, get your horse, Cass. <laughs> now make your choice, Ellen. But I don't think Ethan would think much of you. All right, Marshal. I'll go. But mind what I said. Don't put Luther near Ethan. They wasn't the same kind. Gunsmoke, transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Kathleen Height, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Jeanette Nolan, Sam Edwards, John Daner, Harry Bartell, and Herb Vigran. Parley Bear is Chester. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. This coming Monday evening, hear Richard Widmark as one of the desperate Spencer brothers riding against time and death in a suspense drama well calculated to keep your interest high. Also Monday night, you want to hear CBS Radio's Lux Radio Theater starring Joan Fontaine and Joseph Cotton in the strange drama September Affair. Remember, both this Monday night on most of these same CBS Radio stations. Suspense and Lux Radio Theater. This is Roy Rowan speaking. America now listens to 105 million radio sets and listens most to the CBS Radio Network. Enter the territory on west. There's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke, starring William Conrad. This story of the violence that moved west with young America. 
the story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Could I give you some more coffee? Uh, yeah, I guess so. How about you, Chester? Yes, sir, I believe I will. Uh, why don't you just leave the coffee pot here on the table, Miss Kelly? Why, sure thing, Marshal. Right. Well, I got some fresh eggs this morning, if you're interested. They oh. were just brought in. Well, good, good. Uh, cook us up about a half a dozen of them, huh? Have them for you right away, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> All right. Fresh eggs, my. I'll swear if Del Monaco's ain't getting to be about as fancy as some of them Kansas City restaurants. <laughs> well, that's civilization, Chester. Progress. Another five years, and Dodge City will be tame, curried, and bridled. <laughs> see, and believe it, Mr. Dillon. No, you'll see it. Both of us will see it. That is, if we live that long. Yeah. I beg your pardon, gentlemen. Uh, you Mr. Yeah. Dillon, the marshal here? Uh, yes, that's right. Well, I'm sorry to bother you at breakfast, marshal. My name is Hunter. Ed Hunter. Mr. Hunter. I'm a deputy sheriff from Richmond, Virginia. Come in on the Santa Fe this morning. I see. Well, uh, why don't you pull up a chair, Mr. Hunter? I right, thank you, sir. Uh, Chester Proudfoot, Mr. Hunter. How do you do? How do you do, sir? So here's my first trip to the frontier. I find it a rather remarkable experience. <laughs> I can imagine. Uh, won't you have some coffee? I uh, know, thank you. Marshal, I'm here to arrest two men who are wanted in Virginia. No? Here are the warrants and the orders of extradition. I stopped off for them in Topeka. Uh-huh. Uh. John Allison, Calvin Moore. Both wanted for murder, huh? Hey, do you know these men, Mr. Hunter? No, sir, I don't. Well, the names aren't familiar to me. I never heard of them. Have you a Chester? No, no, sir, Mr. Dillon. Well, I have some information that may help. Not much on Allison, I'm afraid. He shot and killed a bank teller at Greenbrier last spring. Oh? He's about 30 years old, dark hair and mustache, medium build, an excellent horseman and a confirmed gambler. <laughs> Well, that's fine. That narrows it down to about two-thirds of the men in Dodge City. <laughs> well, possibly I can do a bit better in regard to Calvin Moore, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> now, he came down to Richmond from the north and set up practice as a medical doctor. He was about 29 at the time. And he ambushed and shot young Roger Beauregard and then left town. That uh -huh. was uh, 17 years ago. Beauregard's been trying to trace him ever since. Well, I'm afraid that's a pretty well, long time. I have a time picture of Moore, photograph. Oh? Uh -huh. Of course, he was much younger than this. Oh, well, sometimes there's still quite a resemblance, even after 70. Something familiar about that picture, Mr. Dillon? Uh, uh, 17 years. He must be somewhere past 45 now, huh? Hmm. Are you sure that these men are here in Dodge, Mr. Hunter? Reasonably so. Is there something about that photograph that makes you... Well, it's, it's too blurred to tell much about it. Besides, he'd be 17 years older now. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, I tell you what, Mr. Hunter, suppose you leave the picture and the descriptions with me, and I'll check around town, and I'll keep in touch with you. Uh, thank you, sir. Oh, I wonder if you might suggest a good hotel. Uh, certainly. Why don't you try the Dodge House? It's a corner of Railroad Avenue at the end of the plaza of the East End. Uh, tell the deacon I sent you. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Dillon. And I'll be grateful for any help you can give me in this matter. Yeah, please. sure. So long. You want to see the photograph, Chester? Yes, sir, I do. Well, Mr. Dillon, that is... That is... Yeah. What are you going to do, Mr. Dillon? I don't know, Chester. I... He's my friend. I, I, I never asked him anything about his life before he came here. Didn't seem to matter. But now the law says he's a murderer. I'm part of the law. So now it does matter. Maybe it's not him. No, it's him, all right, Chester. You saw it the same as I did. It's dark. Work, 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 work. This is the first chance I've had this week to clean a few instruments properly. Uh, gunshot wounds. Oh, Matt. 
I'll lay odds I'm the only doctor in the United States who makes three-fourths of his living off of gunshot wounds. <laughs> That's a rough country, Doc. Yes, indeed it's a rough country. Uh, maybe you ought to have stayed back east. Yes, huh? see, broken bones, babies, and gunshot wounds. Well, I wouldn't know the first thing about a good civilized case of gout anymore. Uh, what part of the East did you come from, Doc? You see, I went to medical school in Boston. I studied consumption, colic, liver complaints. <laughs> Never had a case of liver complaint in all the time I've been here, though. No, I guess that kind of thing is more common down south, around uh, Richmond, Virginia, for instance, huh? <clears throat> Matt, stop beating around the bush. You've got something on your mind, and it's bothering you. Look, Doc, uh, a deputy sheriff from Virginia came in on the morning train. He's got a warrant for murder against a man named Calvin Moore. He's got a photograph of Moore taken 17 years ago. Would you like to look at it? All things are taken from us and become portions and parcels of the dreadful past. Are you Calvin Moore? It wasn't murder, Matt. They said it was murder, of course. The Beauregards were an important family. Would you like to tell me about it? Oh, not much to tell, Matt. I had been in practice in Richmond about a year. And there was a girl, a beautiful girl, with spirit and fire and that soft radiance that only southern girls seem to have. And, you know, me, that was so long ago. Uh -huh. I've been in the South myself now. Roger Beauregard and I were both caught in this girl. He was a typical Virginia gentleman, hot-headed, used to having his own way. He started threatening me, warning me. And I laughed it off. Then one day I was coming back from a case, and I ran into Roger on a country road. He had a pair of dueling pistols, and he challenged me. What? Well, that's not a crime, Doc. That's self-defense. It's not a crime here or anywhere. Well, I tried to talk him out of it, but he was crazy mad. He shoved one of the pistols in my hand, and he pulled back on his horse, and he leveled his gun. I had no choice. We both fired. He missed. I didn't. Self-defense, yes, but there were no witnesses, and I was an outsider, a Yankee. So you ran for it, is that it? I ran for it. St. Louis, Virginia City... Montana Territory, the Panhandle, Wichita, Abilene, and Dodge. I changed my name to Charles Adams. And the, uh, the girl, Doc, what happened to her? I waited for her in St. Louis. We were married there. Two months later, she died of typhoid fever. Well, you never know. No matter how much you figure you understand somebody, you just quite never know. I can't go back there, Matt. I've got no defense. It... Well, I mean prison. I rot in prison. I won't go back, Matt. Now, Doc, look, Hunter is here after two prisoners. I got no right to, to my own rules to go after one man and keep the other one covered. I always figured that the only kind of law that would work out here is an honest law. What are you going to do? Doc, I don't know. You're late, Matt. I decided you weren't going to stop in tonight. Is Chester around? Kid? Yeah, over there by the ferro table. No. Matt, what about this Virginian who's been hanging around for the last two days? Oh, Hunter? Yeah. He's a deputy sheriff, got a couple of warrants to serve. Why? Well, he's been asking questions. Some of the boys are getting a little skittish. Now, there's no call for it as long as they're not named Allison or Moore. Are you free now, Miss Kitty, huh? or are you busy? What's it look like? Well, I figured maybe he was just killing time. Uh, hiya, Marshal. Bunko? Uh, bought you a drink, Kitty. It's over on the bar. All right. Thanks. Matt, I'll be off in a couple of hours. Drop around. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. I understand you've got a rival lawman in town, Marshal. 
Well, there's a deputy here from Virginia, if that's what you mean. I always figured you were the law here. Is he short in this town, Marshal? Say the word, we'll run him out. I ever ask you for help, Bunko? Well, no. But... When a man's short in Dodge, I'll run him out. And no offense, Marshal. You keep your own cinch tight. Don't worry about anybody else, huh? I'll see you, Bunko. I swear I never saw anybody such bad luck in all my life. My gracious, he ought to swear off Pharaoh and stick this dud. Oh, Chester. Hmm? The old Jethro Keener, he just lost three weeks' pay. And Bunko Benson, sitting right there beside him, mind you, picked up $230. So that's why he's feeling big. Uh, come on, Chester, let's take a walk. Huh? Yes, sir. Three weeks' pay. Mercy, I never saw such luck. What about Doc, Chester? He turned in a couple hours ago. That's when I came on over here. How's he acting? About as usual. No signs of planning to run out, if that's what you mean, Mr. Don. One thing he's doing, though, that he's never done before, he's toting a gun. Uh, good evening, Marshal. Oh, uh, hello, Mr. Hunter. Since you didn't come to me, Mr. Dillon, I've come to you. I'm wondering what progress you've made. Well, I, uh, I'm still checking. Any results at all, Marshal? Well, I don't have much to go on, you know. Now, Calvin Moore was a doctor by profession. He might still be practicing. I suggest we investigate the local doctors. Well, that wouldn't take long. We've only got one, Doc Adams. How long has he been here? Oh, about four years. How old a man is he? Mm, late 40s, I imagine. But he doesn't show much resemblance to that photograph you gave me. Well, maybe you're too used to him to notice the resemblance. Yeah, maybe. I'd like to look him over myself, Marco. Well, uh, he's pretty busy out on calls most of the time. and uh... Not all the time. No, not all the time. All right, Mr. Hunter, I'll bring him around. <laughs> That's funny, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, he should have answered by now. Well, we're wasting our time, Chester. He's gone. Well, now, he, he, he might have got called out on a case. Yeah, I know, but I don't... Hey, what? Uh, that was across the plaza, down toward the Dodge house. Come on, Chester. Somebody sure is stirring up smoke. Yeah, yeah, it's across the street. Edge of the railroad yards, I think. You, Marshal? Yeah. What happened, Mr. Hunter? Somebody tried to kill me. I started into the hotel and they fired from the dock here. Yeah, I fired back, but he got away. You, uh, get a good look at him? Oh, no, I just saw the flashes. Well, this is an easy town to get killed in, Mr. Hunter. So it seems. About that doctor, Marshal, you didn't bring him around. Well, uh, he's out on call. I think I want to meet him more than ever now. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, there's a world of wonderful entertainment awaiting you every weekday in the daytime with CBS Radio's roster of wonderful dramatic serials. This Monday, listen in. And now, for the second act of Gunsmoke. What time is it, Chester? 
2.15 a.m., Mr. Dillon. Yeah. I sure hope we don't have to spend the whole night waiting here. I don't see how Doc puts up with the smell of all this medicine. He's used to it, I guess. Yeah. I suppose a man can get used to anything except dying. You think it could have been him that fired those shots, Mr. Dillon? Chester. Hmm? There's somebody coming. Come on in, Bunko. The doc's not here, but he'll probably be... Oh, what happened to your arm? I... I got thrown into a barbed wire fence. Here, let's have a look at it, huh? No, 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 no. It's, it's all right. It's a gunshot wound. All right, hold it, both of you. Well, is that the same gun you tried to kill Hunter with, Bunko? Stay where you are, Marshal. Yeah. Around 30 years old, dark hair, mustache... Medium build, excellent horseman, re- confirmed gambler. Wanted from her. John Allison. Uh, alias Bunko Benson. Am I right, Bunko? He's not taking me back there. You stay where you are, Dylan. Now, don't be a fool, Bunko. Put away the gun. Stay back. I'm... I'm warning you. Bunko, look! All right, Chester, let's get him over to the jail. Mm, Just hold still now, Bunker. Just Just one more second. I'll have hold that bullet now, and then... We'll just... Ah! Oh, there. <laughs> uh, now, add that one to your collection, Matt. Well, I'll make Hunter a present of it. It wasn't bad shooting to be firing in the dark at a gun flash. He'll never get me back to Virginia. Well, now, hold still, Bunko. Oh, Don't expect right, a man but... to tie a bandage with your oh, arm waving like around like a mare's he... tail in fly time. Oh, see, how'd you know he'd come to my office, Matt? Uh, I didn't, Doc. We were waiting for you. Oh, I see. There we are. No, 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 no. That ought to stop the bleeding. And don't loosen it up, Eddie. <laughs> and you'll live to hang yet. Don't worry about my hanging, Doc. I'll outlive you. Well, in view of the circumstances, uh, I'd say the odds are about even. Well, Matt, shall we adjourn to the front office? Yeah, come on, Doc. Uh, lock the cell, will you, Chester? Yes, sir. Well, I turned in at 10 o'clock tonight. I got one hour of sleep. They called me over to Mrs. Behan's. She thought her baby was on the way. False alarm, of course. Usually is the first time. And I got back and I came straight over here. Uh, Doc, you were wearing a gun earlier today. What'd you do with it? Oh, I put it back in the drawer where it belonged. I realized I was acting like a fool. Uh, was that where you were waiting in my office? Somebody tried to kill Hunter, and, and you thought... Uh, Look, Doc, I, I've i tried to think of some way out of this. Uh, a way out for both of us. I got one man under arrest back there now, and I, I can't rightly set myself up as a judge and free the other man. I've even hoped you'd cut and run for it. You, you'd get away if you did, you know. Hunter doesn't know the country. I've been running for 17 years, Matt, and... I... And it's still caught up with me. I'm too old to run any farther. What are you going to do? I'm a lawman, Doc, right or wrong. Well, then I guess I'm under arrest. Huh? No, I, I, I didn't say that. I, I just said that... Is Doc Evans here? There's a... Oh, oh, there you are, Doc. Yes, yes, what's the trouble? The what's... fellow over in the railroad yards asleep on the track. He was drunk, I guess. They were switching cars. You better come, Doc. He's awful bad. Oh, I... I got two lanterns, Mr. Dillon. That ought to be enough. Good, Chester. You ready, Doc? You're ready as I ever do. All right, let's go, then. 
Uh, he said near the loading pens down this way, I guess. Yes, sir. It looks like some lights over there. People around. Yeah. Marshal, is that you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, Hunter. Uh, I thought you went to bed hours ago. I'm a light sleeper, Mr. Dillon. I heard there's an accident over in the yards. Thought it might give me a chance to meet your local doctor. Well, I uh, guess you can meet him right now if you want to. Doc, this is Ed Hunter, Doc Adams. How do you do, sir? Mr. Hunter? I, uh, I got one of your prisoners locked up, Mr. Hunter, John Allison. Known here as Bunko Benson. Good. I just found out he's the man who tried to kill you tonight. He caught one oh? of your bullets in his arm. Oh, I see. Why, then it's one down and one to go. Just Calvin Moore. Dr. Calvin Moore. Uh, this is no time to stand around making chin music. I'm sorry, well, That's Hunter, quite all right, Marshal. I'll go with you. Uh, will you pardon us, please? Uh, all right, will you move back and let us through here, please? Here, here, Doc, this way. Yeah, I'm right with you, Matt. Uh, please stand back now, will you? Give Doc a chance to yes, work. Yes, uh, please, if you please, just stand back. Uh, oh, oh, bad is right. Uh, well, we'll do what we can. Come on. That man who's hurt, Marshal, who is he? Oh, just a drifter. Been around Dodge a couple of years. Calls himself Texas Joe. No friends or family. Nobody knows where he came from. It's the usual story. Oh, easy now, Tex. We'll have you fixed up here in just a couple of shakes. Is is that you, Doc? Hey, that's right. <laughs> I told him, get you. Be all right if you got here. Why, sure, it'll be all right. You just lie still now. And... Yeah. yeah. Certainly has to work under primitive conditions. Doc? Mm. Yeah. Uh, Chester, will you get those lanterns going and give Doc some more light? Yes, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, he's the only real doctor this side of Abilene. Hey, Mr. Dillon, is there anything I can do to help? I guess not, Miss Kelly. Thanks, anyway. Poor old Tex. Why, he stopped in the restaurant not more than four hours ago. I fixed him a meal. Uh, you never know. Well, Doc can pull him through if anybody can. Sure he can. Uh, put one of those lanterns on the other side there, Chester. Yes, you Doc. You seem to have a lot of faith in this Dr. Adams. They've got reason to, Mr. Hunter. Uh, Matt, uh, could you give me a hand here? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure, Doc. Uh, lift his head up just a little bit there, Matt. Yeah, That's all right. Uh, not much of a chance. All I can do is make him comfortable. Marshal Dillon. No, don't try to talk, Taxi. You're going to be all right. You, you've been decent to me, Marshal. Just a bum, but you treated me square. You and Doc, only friends I got. Sure, Tex. I... I got one more favor to ask. Could someone... Could someone read me some scripture? Well, Tex, I... I just don't recall any of them. I know some. Uh, Mrs. Kelly, I, I doubt if you can... I, I can hear... Please. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Uh, Mrs. Kelly. He restoreth my soul. Uh, Mrs. Kelly. He... Uh, I think that's enough. Of course. Well, you can't win them all, I guess. No, you can't win them all, Doctor. Well, I'm... Doctor, as the only physician here, I suppose you also function as coroner. That's right. Yes. This man will be buried under the name of Texas Joe. Hey, don't you worry about that. Excuse Boot Hill is full of men buried under nicknames. In this country, we... Doc! Doc, I just came to... Oh, what, Kitty? Well, uh, Doc, I, I've been sitting up with Mrs. B, and you left too soon. She needs you over there right away. Well, then it wasn't a false alarm. No. All right, Kitty, I'll be there just as quick as I can, but... Well, well, as soon as I... Uh, Kitty, you go on back over and do what you can for her, huh? 
Uh, Doc will be along. Oh. All right, Matt. But you better hurry. Well, Mr. Hunter, I... Uh... Uh, gentlemen, this seems to have been my lucky night. Both my fugitives located within an hour of each other. I guess there's nothing I one can do. One of them safely to... in jail and one of them dead. What? Uh, didn't you notice the resemblance, Marshal? That Texas Joe there, he's obviously the man in the photograph. I saw it immediately. Well, Mr. I Hunter, hope you'll I... take all the necessary steps to see that he's buried under his real name, Calvin Moore. His death, of course, closes the case, and I'll be leaving for Virginia with my other prisoner tomorrow. Well, Mr. Hunter, I... I just don't know what to say. Well, I... Now, I'd say it's no time to stand around making chin music, Dr. Adams. You have a patient waiting, and this town seems to depend on you. Well, well of course, but... Hey, you got I... work to do, Doc. And, uh, Doc, make sure it's a boy, huh? Well, I'll, uh, um, uh, I'll do my darndest, Matt. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, good night, gentlemen. Good night, Doc. Good night, Doc. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Les Crutchfield, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Lawrence Dobkin, Lou Krugman, Paul Dubov, and Vivi Janis. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas, through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Tomorrow evening, listen for Lionel Barrymore, your host on CBS Radio's Sunday Night Playhouse. There will be another specially selected historical drama or a classic from literature with a cast of stars perfectly suited for the roles in the story. Every Sunday evening, hear Lionel Barrymore on your Sunday Night Playhouse over most of these same CBS radio stations. Truly an outstanding dramatic experience here at the Star's Address. Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, for thrilling dramas of escape, Listen every Sunday night to the CBS Radio Network. and of the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. Starring William Conrad, 
the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, the story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Cleanliness is next to godliness, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, I know, I know, Chester, but all you're doing is getting it off the floor into the air. Man can hardly breathe in here. All right, Mr. Dillon. I'll do my sweeping later. Yeah, good. My mother taught me that, Mr. Dillon. Taught you what, Chester? That cleanliness is next to godliness. She was a fine woman, too. Oh, look, Chester, it's a good saying, and it's probably true, and I got nothing against your mother except that she also should have taught you how to sweep. Well, maybe she just didn't have the time, Mr. Dillon. You see, there was an awful lot of us, and what with chores and... Oh, hello, Doc. Uh, come on, I'll I'll buy you a drink. Uh, What? Doc said he'd buy you a drink, Mr. Dillon. He really said that? You coming? Doc, you got to quit throwing your money around the way you do. Uh, maybe you don't need it. Uh, no, wait a minute, Doc. I, I'm with you. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you all about it when I get back, Chester. I'd be mighty interested, Mr. Dillon. Oh, sure be glad when it gets winter again. Why, Doc? You'll just complain about the cold, then. Oh, uh, I suppose... You go sit with Kitty, Matt. I'll bring a bottle. Okay, Doc. Uh, hello, Kitty. Hello, Matt. What are you and Doc up to? Yeah, he wants someone to talk to, so he picked me. <laughs> and you. Fine. I'm a good listener. <laughs> Lots of practice. <laughs> What are we celebrating? Uh, let's see here. Let's see here. We'll drink to a fellow that you don't know. Uh-huh. Kane Vestal. Well, here's to him. Yeah? Here's to him. <coughs> yes, he'll be dead in a couple of months. What? That's what I told him. What do you mean, Doc? Well, I'm not the only one who's told him that. I'm just the last. Well... Who is this Kane Vestal, Doc? Oh, he's just a fella. Came in on the train last night, leaving for Arizona to my die in Arizona. He's a musician. He plays the guitar, he tells me. Well, how's he going to die? Consumption. He's got it bad. I'm the last doctor he's going to ask about it, he says. Oh, poor fella. Yeah, it's the climate out there. Keep him going for a little while longer. And, uh, oh, I don't know. He's... He's such a sad man for some reason. Well, who wouldn't be, Doc? No, 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 Kitty. I think kane has been sad for a long, long time. He's a very nice fellow, too. Nothing can help him, huh? No, nothing. You know, it's a funny thing, Doc, huh? I'm just sitting here thinking. Sometimes you have to tell men they're going to die. Sometimes I have to. Yeah, that's right, man. Oh, let's see. Uh, there he is. See that fellow with the car there? He just came in. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think he knows anyone around here. You mind if I ask him over? Uh, sure. Your party, Doc. Oh, good. Uh, uh, Kane? Uh, Kane? Uh, over here? Uh. <laughs> uh, uh, sit down. Sit down. Kane, this is Kitty. Uh. Hello, Kane. This is Marshal Dillon. Hello, Marshal. Pleasure to meet you. He's doing it There we are. Have a drink. Well, thank you, Doc. Uh, this your first trip west, Kane? 
Yes, Marshal, it is. Oh, well, where are you from? No place in particular, Miss Kitty. I seem to spend most of my life on the Mississippi River. I, I thought you were a musician. I am. I was hired to ride the river boats and play my guitar for the passengers. Oh. <laughs> well, at least you've had a constant change of scenery. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After 20 years of going up and down that river, it got pretty familiar, Marshal. Well, Kane, I knew a young fella back in St. Louis for the war, and he was learning to be a river pilot. <laughs> Say, I wonder if you ever ran into him, name of Clemens, Sam Clemens. No, Doc, I don't believe I did. Oh, he was a very amusing fella. He was just chock full of stories. Um, you leaving Dodge tomorrow, King? I'm headed for Arizona, Miss Kitty. No reflection on Dodge, though. <laughs> uh, if you hit a place out there called Tombstone, I uh, wish you'd look up Virgil Earp for me. Uh, tell him I sent you, huh? Thanks, Marshal. I'll do that. Say, Kane, I wonder, uh, could I ask you a favor? Well, certainly, Miss Kitty, anything at all. Well, would you play something for us? I had an idea that's what it would be. <laughs> anything in particular? Oh, play something you like, Kane. Another girl I knew used to like this one. going to stay here a while. Maybe you could teach me to play like that. Huh? It'd be a pleasure, Miss Kitty. But I'm afraid I won't be around for long. Morning, Mr. Dillon. It's uh, noon, Chester. Yes, sir, I know, but you went off with Doc yesterday, so I figured I had a little time coming today. Well, that depends on how you spent it. Now, if you've been gambling, oh, I am... now, Mr. Dillon, you know I never gamble. <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. I, I, I was out helping a fellow learn to shoot a six-gun, that's all. Now? You mean there's a man in Dodge who doesn't know how? This fellow don't. Never had one in his hand before. He's a musician. What? It plays the guitar, he told me. You mean Kane? Uh, Kane Vestal? Yes, sir, that's his name. Nice a fellow as you'd ever want to meet. Yeah. But he was supposed to leave on the stage this morning. And what's he done with his six-gun anyway? Well, I don't know, Mr. Dillon. He just come by here early this morning and asked me if I'd teach him. Yeah. Now, where'd he get the gun? Said he'd just bought it. Anything wrong, Mr. Dillon? No, no. It just doesn't add up somehow, that's all. Oh, well, he won't cause any trouble. He's not the sort. You never know, Chester. Mm, no, sir. My kitty looks pretty this morning. She's got a yellow parasol, Mr. Dillon. Kitty? All right, I think I'll go see her for a minute. Uh, I'll be right back, Chester. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Kitty? 
Hello, Matt. <laughs> Kitty, I'd like to talk to you for a minute. Oh, sure. What is it? Uh, I'm curious about something, Kitty. Maybe you can help me. Maybe. How long was Kane Vessel with you yesterday? Kane? Oh, well, he didn't leave till evening. Why? Well, he didn't go out on the stage this morning, and he's bought himself a six-gun. You, you any idea why? A gun? Huh? Doesn't sound like Kane. Anything happened yesterday, Kitty, or did he tell you anything? Well, yeah, might... there was one thing, Matt. Joel Adams and a couple of his men came in. Yeah? Kane got pretty upset when he saw him had a bad coughing spell. Oh? Later, he asked a lot of questions about Adams. Well, what'd you tell him? Just that Adams is a big landowner around here that nobody who isn't working for him likes him very much. That's all I know, anyway. Yeah. Uh, they didn't talk, Adams and Kane. No. I don't think they even know each other. Well, anyway, he sure isn't the sort to be packing a gun. Well, you'll just get into trouble, Matt. Yeah. Uh, where's he staying, did he say? Dodge house, I think. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Kitty. I'll see you later. Come in. Hello, Kane. Well, I'm Marshal Dillon. Come in, come in. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> what can I do for you, Marshal? I, uh, I thought you were leaving Dodge on the stage this morning. Well, I was, Marshal, but I changed my mind. You know how it is. Sure, Kane, sure. Now, we're glad to have you around. I, uh, I'm just curious, though. You're, uh... Stay and have anything to do with that gun you bought this morning? Oh, Chester told you. I thought he would. He's a good teacher, Marshal. <laughs> yeah. But that doesn't answer my question. Do I have to answer it? I'm just trying to help you, that's all. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Marshal, but I'm afraid there's nothing you can do. Look, Kane, you're new in this country. A man like you just can't pick up a six-gun and call himself a fighting man. Not and expect to live through it. I certainly lay no claim to be a fighting man. Well, then why did you buy that gun? There's no law out here against a man having a gun, is there, Marshal? No. But any man who carries one is expected to use it when the time comes. You'd be a lot safer without one. Being safe doesn't mean a whole lot to me, Marshal. Not now. Yeah, I, I know. Doc told me. What's it all about? It's a long story. And an old one, I suppose. I'd really rather not talk about it. Well, I can't force you to. Uh, but, but tell me this. Does it have anything to do with Joel Adams? Yes, it does, Marshal. I'm going to kill him. When? I don't know. Any time. Well, why? That's a long story I mentioned. All right, Kane. But if you try to face him, he'll kill you before you got that gun halfway out of your belt. And if you shoot him any other way, you'll hang for it. You've forgotten something, Marshal. What? No matter what I do, I'm going to die soon anyway. A month or two isn't going to make any difference. You hate Adams that much? I wouldn't kill a man I didn't hate, would I? I didn't think you were the sort of man who'd kill anyone. Only Joel Adams, Marshal. Then I gotta warn him about you. Well, I understand, Marshal. It's all right. He doesn't know me anyway. Never even saw me before. But you want to kill him? Yes, sir. Well, I'll take your gun away from you, but you'll just find another one. 
And I can't arrest you unless I catch you trying to bushwhack him. I'm sorry for the trouble I'm causing you, Marshal. You know, I've never had to deal with a man like you before, Kane. Maybe I ought to just tie you up and throw you on that stage. You could. But I'd just come right back. <sighs> I guess you would. I'm sorry this has to happen here in Dodge, Marshal. Then why don't you leave? I guess I hate Joel Adams too much. All right, Kane, I'm through trying to convince you. So long. Goodbye, Marshal. Vestal, Marshal, and I never saw him before last night. You must have known him somewhere, Adams. You're trying to make me out a liar, Marshal. I'm trying to save Kane's life and yours, maybe. No, he ain't gonna shoot me. I'll kill him first time he looks sideways. Maybe you won't see him. Oh? Shoot me in the back, eh? Well, in that case, it... In that case, what? Why, nothing, Dylan, nothing. Forget it. If Kane's shot in the back, you'll be the first man I'd take in, Adam. I don't even know him. Why should I shoot him? I'm only warning you. Well, just leave me be, Marshal. I can take care of myself. See that you do, Adams, and only yourself. Why, sure, Marshal. I, mean, I don't much like the idea of some stranger gunning for me. Makes me sort of uneasy. There must be some reason for it. Don't start it again, Marshal. There ain't no reason. I know. You've led a blameless life. You never hurt anyone. I you, told Adam? you twice. There are men around you. here who'd shoot you on sight if they thought they could get by with it. I don't think you were ever any good, Adam, so don't tell me a Kane's got no reason. I don't You're believe it. You're pushing me now, Marshal. I'm Marco. tired of your talk, that's all. Maybe it's true you don't know him, but he sure knows something about you. Well, then he'll wish you didn't. That's all I got to say. Well, just keep out of his way. Give it a little time, and maybe there won't be any killing at all. Why, sure, sure. All the time in the world. All right, Adams. I've done all I can. Just don't worry about me. I'm not. Then goodbye, Marshal. Goodbye. Return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, the poignant story of Jane Froman, adapted from the movie with a song in my heart, was selected by you listeners through a national magazine as the one you would like most to hear on Lux Radio Theater. So this Monday night, listen for Susan Hayward, Roy Calhoun, David Wayne, Thelma Ritter, and Bob Wagner of the movie cast when CBS Radio presents Lux Radio Theater. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. Sure is quiet around town tonight, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. There's a trail herd due in in a couple of days. I suppose business will pick up then. Mm. You'd think those cowboys be too tuckered out after a ride like that to have any juice left in them at all, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> yeah, they're too poor to cut loose any other time. Well, that don't stop them down in Texas, Mr. Dillon. No? No. It's just like an uncle of mine back in Waco. He was poor, oh, he was mean poor. But he always said the only good money was was to have fun with. Oh, did he have fun? But well, no, sir. He was too poor, like I said. <laughs> all right, Chester, all right. All I ask is that you don't try to explain it to me. Well, but there's nothing to explain, Mr. Dillon. It, it's just uh, it's just that he was the Chester. one poorest Chester. man you'd ever... Uh, Marshal, say, you want to talk to Kane Vestal? What? Uh, Kane is upstairs in my office. He been shot? No, no, not shot. Beat up. Well, how is he, Doc? Well, he's not too bad. 
couple of cowboys found him just outside of town. They heard a shot and said two men rolled off before they could stop them. Yeah? And I guess who, whoever it was, they didn't have time to finish the job. They just got started working on it. So Adams made the first move, huh? Uh, I'll be back soon, Chester. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. <clears throat> They hit him on the head with a gun butt and scratched him up some. Outside of that, he's fine. It's still a stall, even if they didn't kill him, Doc. Yeah, I suppose it is. Anyway, they took a shot at him when they heard those riders coming along. Went right through his coat. Yeah. They probably think he's dead. So that's where you went, Doc. I might have known. Didn't even give you a chance to use that gun, did he, Kane? I didn't have a gun on me, Marshal, but it wasn't he. It was they. Huh? Do you recognize them? Well, I don't know many people around here. You know Joel Adams, or so you told me. It wasn't Adam. Could you pick him out if you saw him again? No, Mar- Marshal, I don't believe I could. Where were you when they grabbed you, Kane? Into Front Street. I was taking a walk after supper. They rode up behind me, one on each side lifted me up and mm-hmm. carried me out of town a ways. You must have got a good look at them, at least when they got off their horses. It was too dark, Marshal. Yeah. Doc, how long has he been here? Oh, about half an hour, Marshal. I... Those cowboys who saw you came, they brought you right in here, didn't they? Yes. So it was maybe an hour ago when those two men hauled you out of town? It was plenty light enough then. Was it, Marshal? You're going to fight it yourself, aren't you? Yes, Marshal. It, it's my affair. It was, Kane, but you've been assaulted and shot at, so it's the law's business now. I won't prefer any charges, Marshal. You don't have to. I've seen you, and I know who did it or who hired it done as well as you oh, do. Please, Marshal. i got to handle this my own way. There's a law that says you can't murder a man, Kane, and the same law says he can't murder you. Are you so full of hate you can't get that through your head? guess that's it, Marshal. All right, Kane. You do what you have to do. So will I. It's late, Dylan. Can't you see me tomorrow? It's not even midnight. That's early for you. <laughs> you see how this marshal's always trying to get me on the prod, boys? Yes, sir. These boys of yours play pretty rough themselves, Adams. Meaning? Didn't they tell you? Tell me what? What they did to Kane Vestal? They did not kill Kane Vestal, and you can't prove it. No, Adams, I can't. Kane isn't even dead. What? You know, I'm curious, Adams. Why'd you think he might be? Why, why, if somebody said he got himself hurt. Joel Adams. You arranged this, Marshal? You know I didn't. Who is he? What does he want? Hello, Joel Adams. Don't strain yourself so you don't know me. Who are you? Kane Vastel. But my name doesn't matter. What are you haunting me for? I never saw you before in my life. That's true. You didn't. But we had a friend in common once. A friend? Who? Julie Travis. What about Julie? You were a riverboat gambler then, Adams, and you had money and fine clothes and away with women, especially young girls. Julie was only 16 at the time. Never mind all that. So she went away with you to be married, you told her. Oh. <laughs> I think I guessed the rest. You wanted to marry her, but I got her instead. Is that it? That's it, Adam. <laughs> That's exactly it. Oh, no, I thought you really had something on your mind, Vestal. Well, all right, why don't you get out of here and quit bothering people while you can still walk? Julie killed herself, Adam. She committed suicide. 
What? You didn't know that, did you? Well, it's got nothing to do with me. Because you never married her after all. It was just a year after you abandoned her in New Orleans. I think it has a lot to do with you, Joel Adams. What are your plans, mister? I see you got a gun in your belt. Gonna kill you. Or so? When? Now. Right now. All right, Vestal, draw. Leave the gun where it is, Kane. One thing I always promised myself, Adams. Someday I'd spit in your face. <coughs> Why, you... Give me the gun, Adams. He's dead. Well, he was going to kill me. You heard him. He wanted you dead, Adams, any way he could manage. I know it. That's what I say. You're under arrest for murder. For... What? It was a gunfight. He never even moved for his gun. Well, then I'll hang for this. He couldn't have got me any other way. No, don't suppose he could have. I remember the river gamblers used to say... No matter how you win, so long as you win. That Kane should have been a gambler. Maybe he was. Come on, let's go. Gunsmoke, transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Harry Bartell and Lawrence Dobkin. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. And now for a special announcement. There have been many requests for information regarding our theme. It's called Old Trail and was written especially for us by Rex Corey, our musical director. If you will write to Gunsmoke in care of your local CBS radio station, we will try to give you whatever specific information you may desire. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. This Monday night on most of these same CBS radio stations hear William Powell in a startling anti-communist drama titled The Man Who Cried Wolf. Remember to hear Suspense, starring William Powell, on most of these same CBS radio stations this Monday night. This is Roy Rowan speaking. America now listens to 105 million radio sets and listens most to the CBS radio network. Thank you for listening. Please like and subscribe.